Wild Plants Needing Protection by Elizabeth G. Britton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bologna Times. Wild Plants Needing Protection. Reprinted without change of paging from the Journal of the New York Botanical Garden, May 1912. Number 1. Jack in the Pulpit. Jack in the Pulpit. Erisema triphylum. When the trees are unfolding their fresh green leaves in May and June, and the violets and spring beauties are in bloom, Jack in the pulpit may be found in moist woodlands and on shady banks where the earth is soft and loamy. It is a perennial herb, and if left undisturbed, it sometimes lives many years and attains a height of three feet, with a subterranean corm as large as an apple. This corm has given to the plant the name of Indian turnip, though it is not edible when raw, for it has an acrid taste, irritating to the tongue, on account of the acicular crystals of calcium oxalate which it contains, known as raphids. It propagates by forming smaller secondary corms around the older ones, and in this way new plants are started. It often bears no fruit in the vicinity of New York, not only on account of the depredations of children, but because it is dioecious and the proper insect visitors on which it is dependent for pollination seem to be lacking. Usually the leaves turn yellow and the plant disappears in June and July, though this varies in different portions of its range, which extends throughout the eastern and central states and as far north as Nova Scotia and Ontario and south to Florida and Louisiana. It bears what would appear to most children to be a single large flower, but it is really a cluster of small simple flowers born at the base of a fleshy club-shaped spadix which is enclosed by the convolute base of the spathe, the summit of which arches over it and is either pale green or a dark glossy brown, often striped with white. There are usually two leaves, which are three-parted, graceful in shape, and beautifully veined. The leaf stalks are sheathing at base and enclose that of the flower cluster. The staminate plants are often smaller and paler than the pistillate, and wither as soon as they have discharged their pollen. Their flowers consist of only two to four almost sessile white or purple anthers born on the fleshy mucilaginous base of the spadix. The pistils are crowded together without calyx or corolla, green, globose, and tipped with a sessile white stigma. Occasionally a few stamens may be found above the pistils. The fruit cluster when ripe is usually prostrate from one to three inches long and the berries are bright scarlet plucanet appears to have been the first to figure this plant and he described it in his phytographia in sixteen ninety one as arum triphylum minus atrorubente from plants sent to him by bannister from virginia linnaeus in his species plantarum 1753, quoted this description and called it Arum triphylum. It resembles some of the European species of Arum and belongs to the Araceae, a family of plants, most of which are tropical in their distribution, and which includes about 105 genera and over 900 species, many of them being large and showy plants, often climbing on trees and rocks. 2. Spring Beauty Reprinted from the Journal of New York Botanical Garden, June 1912 
spring beauty claytonia virginica in wet meadows on grassy banks and even shady woodlands the spring beauty covers the ground in may with quantities of white flowers it blooms consecutively for two or three weeks opening a new blossom every day gradually lengthening out its racemes till sometimes they have borne as many as fifteen flowers these measure half an inch or more across have white or pale pink petals veined with rose color the stamens are five with pink anthers and the style is three-lobed there are two fleshy spreading sepals and the pedicels lengthen gradually from one half to an inch in length and become reflexed as the three-angled capsule matures halfway down the stem below the raceme two narrow fleshy leaves three or four inches long clasp the stem and a few basal ones arise from the large tuberous root which is buried rather deeply in the ground usually only the flowering stems are picked so that the plant survives but it will make no seed and stand little chance of spreading the seeds are brown reniform slightly roughened and the embryo is curved the spring beauty was named by Linnaeus in 1753 in honor of John Clayton, an American botanist and correspondent who wrote in 1743 of Flora of Virginia. It was first figured by Plucanet in his Phytographia in 1691. There are about 25 species of Claytonia known to grow in northern North America, of which three occur in the eastern United States. One of these with broader leaves, Claytonia Caroliniana michix, having about the same range as Claytonia virginica from Nova Scotia southward along the Alleghenies to Georgia and Texas. They belong to the purslane family or Portulacaceae, with which they agree in their fleshy leaves and flowers that bloom for a short time. The family is a large one, but the plants are usually small, few of them with showy flowers like Portulaca grandiflora, which occasionally escapes from cultivation. Number 3. Wild Pink Reprinted from the Journal of the New York Botanical Garden, July 1912. Wild Pink Celine Caroliniana Walt. Before the trees cast much shade, while their greens are still so exquisitely fresh and varied, a bright flash of color will attract the eye to the wild pink, growing in hilly places on rocks or often in their cracks and crevices with the saxifrage. The beautiful rose pink and size of its flowers renders it very conspicuous, for it often makes a large patch or cushion with a number of stems about six to ten inches high, each bearing from three to five showy flowers more than an inch across. Each petal is wedge-shaped, with a long, pale white basal claw enclosed in the tubular five-notch calyx and crowned at the summit of each claw by two erect white appendages. The stamens are immersed in the tube, ten in number, five long and five short, with purple anthers and slender white filaments attached at the base of the ovary, which terminates in three short styles. The pod is stipitate, developing in the upper half of the withered calyx, splitting at apex into six recurved segments. The seeds are borne on a central column and are small and numerous, kidney-shaped, and brown, with a rough surface. The whole plant is viscid with glandular hairs, forming a ciliate margin to the leaves, which are opposite, clasping at base a swollen joint of the stem. Usually each stem has three pairs of leaves, decreasing in size upward. The basal shoots have longer leaves, all gracefully recurved. 
and forming a crowded cluster at the summit of a long, strong, fibrous taproot, which often penetrates deep down into some crevice and breaks off when uprooted. For this reason, the plant frequently survives, in spite of its showy blossoms, though it is not abundant any longer, where it is frequently picked. The wild pink was described by Thomas Walter in his Flora of Carolina in 1788, and re-described by André Michaud in 1803 as Celine Pennsylvanica. It often grows in sandy or rocky soil on the borders of woods from Maine to Georgia in the eastern states, along the Alleghenies, and flowers from April to June. It belongs to the pink family, or Caryophyllaceae, a large family of about 70 genera and over 1,500 species, which are widely distributed, mostly in temperate regions. The generic name, Celine, was given by Linnaeus in 1753 in reference to the viscid hairs and about 250 species are known of which many are showy, graceful plants, the showiest perhaps being the fire pink, Celine virginica, and the most graceful, the starry campion, Celine stellata. Number four wild columbine reprinted from journal of the new york botanical garden august 1912 wild columbine aquilegia canadensis nodding in the cool winds of springtime and so lightly poised on its slender stems that it is almost impossible to take its photograph the wild columbine adorns the rocks and ledges in May with its gay red and yellow blossoms and occasionally is found in fields at middle elevations where it blooms until July. The flowers are pendant, about one to two inches long, bright red, the five short red sepals overlapping five tubular spurs which terminate below in thickened honey sacs and broaden out above into five short yellow petals attached around a long exerted cluster of slender yellow stamens about fifty in number these are attached in five rows to a disc at the base of the ovaries which are five in number and hairy with five long slender styles they develop into five follicles with long spreading points each follicle contains about fifteen shining black seeds attached along the ventral suture. The basal leaves are pale green beneath, three-parted, and each leaflet again divided into three toothed lobes. Smaller, short-stalked, simpler leaves also grow on the flower stalks and diminish into bracts above. The stems vary in height from one to two feet and are smooth or slightly hairy above. The root is fibrous and easily uprooted, and for this reason the plant largely depends on its seeds for reproduction and is likely to be quickly exterminated on account of its showy flowers. Occasionally plants are found with pale yellow blossoms growing among the normal ones. It ranges from Nova Scotia to Northwest Territory, south to Florida and Texas, and ascends to high altitudes in the Alleghenies and the Rocky Mountains. It was first described and figured by Camuti in 1635, and was called Octalesia canadensis by Linnaeus in 1753. The generic name refers to a fancied resemblance of the spurs to the talons of an eagle. On this account, and the wide range of the genus throughout the United States, it has been strenuously advocated for the honor of being called the national flower. About 15 species of Aquilegia are known from the United States, ranging through the Rocky Mountains into Mexico and the western states. All have showy flowers varying from white to yellow and blue, and are greatly prized in cultivation. This genus 
belongs to the crowfoot family ranunculaceae of which about thirty five genera and one thousand and fifty species are distributed throughout the temperate regions of the world number five bird's foot violet reprinted from the journal of the new york botanical garden september nineteen twelve bird's foot violet viola pirata after the spring is well advanced and most of the other violets have been in bloom for nearly two weeks the bird foot violet comes to show how lovely a violet can be its flowers are larger and more delicate in color than any other of our wild species the petals spread with a jaunty air like a pansy and vary in color from deep violet to pale lavender or white they stand above the leaves on long stout pedicels and when growing in masses as they used to on the hempstead plains of long island and tot hill on staten island are as showy as any of the alpine violets of europe comparing favorably with the long spurred pansy of the alps viola calcarata the leaves give the plant its specific and common name from a fancied resemblance to a bird's foot they are palmately divided almost to the base into narrow segments which are entire or again divided into three to five wedge-shaped subdivisions there is greater variability in the shape and size of the leaves and they also vary from nearly smooth to quite hairy the rootstocks are erect and stout scaly above and bear a large number of leaves and flowers on each so that the temptation is to pull up the whole plant at once when growing luxuriantly they sometimes reach a foot in height with a dozen or more flowers open at once the leaf stalks and pedicels are tinted with purple and vary from two to six inches or more in length the two upper petals are bent backwards over the short spur the two lateral ones are spreading and the lower is broader and keeled paler and veined with dark purple stripes the base projecting to form a spur in which a fragrant honey is found the stamens are five the two lower ones spurred and all bear an orange colored prolongation beyond the anthers which project and surround the green club-shaped stigma with a very small central stigmatic surface the ovary is superior one called three-angled three-parted when ripe and bears the seeds in three rows on the walls the five sepals also are unequal thickened at base and auricled the peculiar structure of the stamens and the fact that two of them have claws extending down into the honey-bearing spur are evidently aids in the fertilization by insects and many of the violets are known to hybridize Viola pedata was named by Linnaeus in 1753 in his species Plantarum, but it was first described and figured by Plucinet in 1691 as Viola virginiana tricolor, Folus multifidus cauchulo aphila, in the vicinity of Washington D.C. and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania the form known as tricolor in which the two upper petals are dark purple is more common about one hundred and fifty species of violets are known from all the temperate parts of the globe a few occur at high altitudes in the tropics the viola sea comprise fifteen genera and three hundred species widely distributed some of them are trees End of wild plants needing protection this recording is in the public domain the flying machine of the future from practical aeronautics by charles b hayward this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bologna Times. Now that flying has become an accomplished fact, speculation as to just what the flying machine of the future will look like is quite as rife as it ever was when mankind generally regarded human flight as one of those long-cherished delusions which, like perpetual motion, would endure to torment the inventive mind as long as the race existed. Wondrously impossible contrivances, as large as the modern skyscraping hotel, are talked of and pictured, and the imagination is drawn upon to supply details that will probably never exist elsewhere. But the developments of the past few years have been so marvelous and so rapid that some, even, of what now appear to be wholly fanciful machines may actually be built in the future. With all that has been accomplished in the past five years, it is evident that the first steps have scarcely been taken. The only thing that actually has been achieved is the establishment of the principles upon which human flight is based. Those elusive laws of science that had been sought in vain for centuries previous. So far as the machines themselves are concerned, they can be scarcely be said to have advanced very much. They still represent the same crude assemblage of wood, wire, and canvas that the Wright brothers and their numerous predecessors were forced to adopt for their experiments as they represented the only materials available. Before going into this phase of the matter at any length, however, it will be of interest to take up the question as to just what type of machine is likely to survive. Unpromising Types Ornithopter It was only logical that first attempts at flight should be patterned after nature Many were of the opinion that if man were ever to fly, he must imitate the birds. Strangely enough, some people are still of this opinion. But since flight, based upon a scientific study of the laws governing sustentation in the air, has become a reality, they are in the minority. Man's weight in proportion to the power he is able to exert is so puny in comparison with that of the birds as to make any possibility of development along this line out of the question. Flying with power-driven wings is likewise extremely problematical, as will be apparent when the weight that must be sustained in the air is taken into consideration. The mechanism necessary to cause huge wings to beat in imitation of the bird would not only be weighty and complicated, but likewise extremely inefficient as compared with the propeller-driven soaring plane, which in itself has a great deal of room for improvement. Yet the hope of eventually being able to fly with an ornithopter, as this type of machine is termed, is not yet dead. A Californian, H. Lavie Twining, has carried out an unusually promising series of experiments on a small scale, employing man's power exerted through the medium of bicycle pedals and gearing. It is very much to be feared, however, that like the hot air engine and numerous other inventions that appeared to promise great results from the success achieved with a small model, the ornithopter would be about as cumbersome and hopeless as its name when attempted on a scale large enough to be of any practical use. Helicopter. Just as there is a certain class that still looks to the ultimate development of the ornithopter, so is there likewise another class which does not appear to be influenced to any great extent by the fact that flight is an established fact. This latter class pens its faith to the helicopter, which affords a still further example of how misleading may be the results obtained with a small model as related by the Wright brothers in their experience with toy helicopters. 
A helicopter consists essentially of a motor and a propeller, the propeller being designed to rotate in a horizontal plane and to carry the machine and the aviator aloft by reason of its downward thrust. This is the simplest type of helicopter, next to the toy of the same name, but there are other types which differ only in the elaboration of their detail or in the combinations with other elements, such as planes, which tend to obscure their true character. Usually two propellers have been employed, designed to turn in opposite directions, in order that the tendency of one to rotate the whole machine with it could be offset by the other. The fallacy of the helicopter seems very self-evident, and yet large sums of money and no little inventive effort have been expended in attempting to evolve something practical out of the principle of sustentation by means of the thrust of a horizontal propeller. If the object of a flying machine were merely to shoot straight up into the air from the ground like a rocket, it might be worth something to be able to start into the air without the necessity of running along the ground which is the chief advantage claimed by its advocates, though but one helicopter has ever done so with an aviator. But the single reason for the existence of the aeroplane is the same as that of the locomotive, the steamship, the automobile, the bicycle, and the wagon transportation. And the ability to ascend straight up into the air does not bring with it any capacity for traveling in a horizontal plane. In addition to being unable to move except in a vertical plane, the helicopter likewise has the somewhat serious disadvantage of being totally without any supporting surface in case of failure of the motive power. And even with the highly developed internal combustion motor of the present day, it would indeed be a foolhardy aviator who would risk his life in a machine in which the failure of the power, for even a moment, meant certain death. Paul Cornu, a Frenchman, developed this type far beyond any of his contemporaries, and he is said to have actually succeeded in getting off the ground, thus showing an advance in that highly important particular over other helicopter machines so far built. This machine is likewise an improvement in design, as the propellers are so mounted that they can be turned at an angle, as was the case with Wellman's dirigible, the idea being that once in the air at the desired height, the thrust of the propellers, or at least one of them, could be exerted in a horizontal direction, while the other served as a support thus providing for horizontal travel. Coming down from a height of 9,000 feet with a dead motor, as has been done in an aeroplane, would be a brief and exciting experience in a Cornu helicopter. Another attempt to provide a means of horizontal travel took the form of inclined planes. These were not intended in any way for support but merely to send the machine ahead by reason of the reaction of the thrust of the horizontal propellers upon them. At the present writing, it seems highly improbable that anything practical will ever be done with either the ornithopter or the helicopter. Miscellaneous. Apart from the types mentioned, there are hundreds that could not be classified except as freaks the majority of which are not worth even passing mention. One of these, the chief merit of which appears to be its novelty, this is a combination dirigible balloon and aeroplane, though just what is to be gained in evolving such a hybrid is difficult to explain. It is neither one nor the other, and has the disadvantages of both without the merits of either. The gas bag is not of sufficient size to effectually support any weight, while, on the other hand, it is so large as to prove practically an anchor for the aeroplane, which could make but a very slow speed with such an encumbrance. End of The Flying Machine of the Future
Woman Suffrage by Bertha Rembaugh from The Birth of the New Party or Progressive Democracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times Woman Suffrage This is not the first time that a party with a national platform has placed in that platform a plank favoring woman suffrage. Both the socialists and prohibitionists have in repeated presidential campaigns included it in their program. But this is the first time when the adoption or rejection of such plank has had more than an academic interest, because for the first time the question comes before the people in the program of a party, not of doctrinaries and dreamers, but of men intent, to be sure, upon principle, but also intent upon carrying, and capable of carrying, such principle to a practical victory. The inclusion of this plank in the platform of the National Progressive Party is significant, and it is gratifying to those of us who have for many years, in season and out of season, preached woman suffrage, but it is not surprising, and it is not unexpected. It is the logical and natural development of those impulses and those forces which have made the Progressive Party. That party is in existence as the result of the expression, overt and insistent at last, of a great and growing demand among the people of the United States that the standards of political morality shall true up to those of private morality, that the conscience of the collective whole shall be of the same fiber as the conscience of the majority of the individuals who make up that whole, that the American citizen shall be at least as decent in his methods as a politician as he is in his home and in his private business. It is natural that in the platform of this party should appear a demand for woman suffrage, for to this awakened moral sense that demand directly appeals, and it appeals for various cogent reasons. In the first place, the history of the nation has made democracy with us a moral instinct rather than a political doctrine. It is beside the point to discuss the intellectual sanction of this instinct. It is enough that the instinct is so deeply implanted in the national consciousness that even those persons and combinations of persons who most outrage the principles of democracy in their conduct have not the effrontery to deny it in their speech, that with what continental Europe calls our Anglo-Saxon hypocrisy, all of us talk respectively of the rights of the people no matter how we violate them. This sense of democracy, part of our heritage from our revolutionary forefathers, while it has endured throughout our national life, has had moments of increased and moments of decreased vitality. The present is one of the moments of increased vitality. Everywhere is the demand that the democracy we profess shall become real and that the people shall, in fact, be allowed to rule. If the people, in fact, rule, woman suffrage is inevitable. There can be no true democracy if one half of demos is paralyzed and helpless, and unless we stultify ourselves and give the lie to all our history, there can be no perfection of American political institutions upon the lines of American development an American moral consciousness until all the American people are part of those political institutions, free to function in them directly and powerfully, instead of slowly and inefficiently by indirect influence. Furthermore, the moral sense of the nation is increasingly conscious of the inherent abstract injustice of its political attitude towards its women that one half of the population who must bear equally with the other half all the burdens of government, its taxes, 
direct and indirect, who must equally conform to its edicts or pay the equal penalty for their violation, that this one half of the population can have no control or influence upon the creation or management of that government is inherently unjust. Surely, if the philosophers and economists have left us permission to believe in any fundamental and natural rights, such rights must be violated by this discrimination. But the most vital, the most compelling, because the most concrete reason for the interest of the awakened American citizen in woman's suffrage lies in the large body of questions before him, which have ceased to be entirely or even mainly economic, and which have now become moral questions, and in the presence before him for solution of an even larger number of other questions, dealing directly with that personal and individual morality, which is the one field where from time immemorial woman's judgment and woman's instinct has been held to be of as sound and cogent a quality as man's. Women have been often in the past thought mentally or physically incapable of this or that effort, mentally or physically unworthy of this or that privilege. They have never been thought inferior when it came to the vision of duty or to its performance. Now the question of this vision of duty and its performance is increasingly becoming a factor in politics. The American people have realized the significance of that pestilence, which for lack of some more accurate name we call the white slave traffic, and the moral and physical damnation wrought by it every year to thousands of men and women. They have begun to realize the cost in human souls, as well as bodies, of letting little children work out their school time and their playtime in factories. They have even begun to realize what happens when women are compelled to work for such hours and under such conditions as make it impossible for them to maintain decent homes and rear normal children. They have to realize that when police officials take money for allowing gamblers to break the law and kill, or connive at the killing, of possible informers to stop their tales, something else has happened besides a miscarriage of administrative efficiency. They have begun to realize when big business eliminates competition and reduces the cost of production that something else may have happened besides commendable business organization. They have begun to realize that great, simple, and personal moral laws have been broken in these cases, and that communities as well as persons may be criminals. It is no reflection upon the morality of men, nor upon their intelligence, that they are coming to see the great moral political questions. The constructive value of much that they have already done, and that they are now trying to do upon these lines, is admitted. Neither is it claimed that women will solve these problems at once or that they could, unaided, do better at the solution than men have done. Perhaps alone they might not even do as well. Least of all, is it any accusation that there has been on the part of men intentional injustice toward women, or intentional blindness toward the moral questions and issues for which women have cared? We are willing to allow as indeed we feel we must allow, due credit for all the devotion to the ideals of public morality and decency and efficiency for which great men have times without number splendidly sacrificed themselves, for which many men have striven nobly, and for which the average man has, with average constancy, done his average best. We admit, moreover, that women are politically inexperienced, that they have much to learn in the matter of playing the game, that they will doubtless make many blunders in the progress of their learning. We admit, if you like, that women have upon many occasions been very silly, very hysterical, and very impractical. Also that they will probably be so again. We admit that utopia will not come at once when women vote, 
Perhaps Utopia will never come anyway. But we do claim that the men facing these new old problems of public ethics as applied to concrete public facts and conditions cannot afford, if they wish to solve these problems intelligently, to ignore one half of the people who might assist them in their work, a part of the people just now deeply stirred to great endeavor, who would bring a new and unfettered moral outlook to the electorate and a new and vital force to the public service. In the early days of the movement for woman suffrage, it was met by many arguments against its fitness, against its possibility, and against its inherent righteousness. The day of these arguments has gone by, and in their place we are met with an almost endless array of more or less practical questions, half-veiled hostility, half-real inquiry. We are asked whether the undesirable and criminal women will not make more use of the ballot in proportion to their numbers than the respectable women, whether the number of the ignorant foreign voters will not be increased out of proportion to the increase of the electorate. We are asked what has been the effect of woman suffrage where tried on various economic questions, such as equal pay for equal work. We are asked whether, as a matter of fact, the woman voter will not sooner or later find herself because of her inherent temperament in the ranks of the conservatives and stand patters and so will prove a drag on human progress and not a help to it we are asked whether as a matter of fact nine-tenths of the women voters do not eventually find themselves in the ranks of the socialists we are asked innumerable questions some silly some wise all of them answerable, we believe, to the satisfaction of any fair-minded citizen. But to answer them would require space and time, not now, at my disposal. End of Woman Suffrage by Bertha Rimbaugh This recording is in the public domain. The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man, Chapter 1, by James Weldon Johnson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bologna Times. Chapter 1, The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man. I know that in writing the following pages, I am divulging the great secret of my life, the secret which for some years I have guarded far more carefully than any of my earthly possessions. And it is a curious study to me to analyze the motives which prompt me to do it. I feel that I am led by the same impulse which forces the unfound out criminal to take somebody into his confidence, although he knows that the act is liable even almost certain to lead to his undoing. I know that I am playing with fire, and I feel the thrill which accompanies that most fascinating pastime. And, back of it all, I think I find a sort of savage and diabolical desire to gather up all the little tragedies of my life and turn them into a practical joke on society. And, too, I suffer a vague feeling of unsatisfaction of regret, of almost remorse from which I am seeking relief, and of which I shall speak in the last paragraph of this account. I was born in a little town of Georgia a few years after the close of the Civil War. I shall not mention the name of the town, because there are people still living there who could be connected with this narrative. I have only a faint recollection of the place of my birth. At times I can close my eyes and call up in a dreamlike way things that seem to have happened ages ago in some other world. I can see in this half-vision a little house. I am quite sure it was not a large one. I can remember that flowers grew in the front yard, and that around each bed of flowers was a hedge of very-colored glass bottles 
stuck in the ground neck down. I remember that once, while playing around in the sand, I became curious to know whether or not the bottles grew as the flowers did, and I proceeded to dig them up to find out. The investigation brought me a terrific spanking, which indelibly fixed the incident in my mind. I can remember, too, that behind the house was a shed, under which stood two or three wooden wash-tubs. These tubs were the earliest aversion of my life, for regularly on certain evenings I was plunged into one of them and scrubbed until my skin ached. I can remember to this day the pain caused by the strong, rank soap getting into my eyes. Back from the house, a vegetable garden ran, perhaps seventy-five or one hundred feet, but to my childish fancy it was an endless territory. I can still recall the thrill of joy, excitement, and wonder it gave me to go on an exploring expedition through it, to find the blackberries, both ripe and green, that grew along the edge of the fence. I remember with what pleasure I used to arrive at and stand before a little enclosure in which stood a patient cow chewing her cud, how I would occasionally offer her through the bars a piece of my bread and molasses, and how I would jerk back my hand in half fright if she made any motion to accept my offer. I have a dim recollection of several people who moved in and about this little house, but I have a distinct mental image of only two. One, my mother, and the other, a tall man with a small dark mustache. I remember that his shoes or boots were always shiny, and that he wore a gold chain and a great gold watch, with which he was always willing to let me play. My admiration was almost equally divided between the watch and chain and the shoes. He used to come to the house evenings, perhaps two or three times a week, and it became my appointed duty whenever he came to bring him a pair of slippers, and to put the shiny shoes in a particular corner. He often gave me in return for this service a bright coin, which my mother taught me to promptly drop into a little tin bank. I remember distinctly the last time this tall man came to the little house in Georgia. That evening before I went to bed, he took me up in his arms and squeezed me very tightly. My mother stood behind his chair, wiping tears from her eyes. I remember how I sat upon his knee and watched him laboriously drill a hole through a ten-dollar gold piece, and then tie the coin around my neck with a string. I have worn that gold piece around my neck the greater part of my life, and still possess it, but more than once I have wished that some other way had been found of attaching it to me besides putting a hole through it. On the day after the coin was put around my neck, my mother and I started on what seemed to be an endless journey. I knelt on the seat and watched through the train window the corn and cotton fields pass swiftly by until I fell asleep. When I fully awoke, we were being driven through the streets of a large city, Savannah. I sat up and blinked at the bright lights. At Savannah we boarded a steamer which finally landed us in New York. From New York we went to a town in Connecticut which became the home of my boyhood. My mother and I lived together in a little cottage which seemed to me to be fitted up almost luxuriously. There were horsehair-covered chairs in the parlor and a little square piano. There was a stairway with red carpet on it leading to a half-second story. There were pictures on the walls and a few books in a glass-doored case. My mother dressed me very neatly, and I developed that pride which well-dressed boys generally have. She was careful about my associates, and I myself was quite particular. As I look back now, I can see that I was a perfect little aristocrat. My mother rarely went to anyone's house, but she did sewing, and there were a great many ladies coming to our cottage. If I were around, they would generally call me, and ask me my name and age, and tell my mother what a pretty boy I was. Some of them would pat me on the head and kiss me. My mother was kept very busy with her sewing. Sometimes she would have another woman helping her. 
I think she must have derived a fair income from her work. I know, too, that at least once each month she received a letter. I used to watch for the postman, get the letter, and run to her with it. Whether she was busy or not, she would take it and instantly thrust it into her bosom. I never saw her read one of them. I knew later that these letters contained money, and what was to her more than money. As busy as she generally was, she, however, found time to teach me my letters and figures and how to spell a number of easy words. Always on Sunday evening she opened the little square piano and picked out hymns. I can recall now that whenever she played hymns from the book her tempos were always decidedly largo. Sometimes on other evenings, when she was not sewing, she would play simple accompaniments to some old southern songs which she sang. In these songs she was freer, because she played them by ear. Those evenings on which she opened the little piano were the happiest hours of my childhood. Whenever she started toward the instrument, I used to follow her with all the interest and irrepressible joy that a pampered pet dog shows when a package is opened in which he knows there is a sweet bit for him. I used to stand by her side, and often interrupt and annoy her by chiming in with strange harmonies which I found either on the high keys of the treble or low keys of the bass. I remember that I had a particular fondness for the black keys. Always on such evenings, when the music was over, my mother would sit with me in her arms often for a very long time. She would hold me close, softly crooning some old melody without words, all the while gently stroking her face against my head. Many and many a night I thus fell asleep. I can see her now, her great dark eyes looking into the fire, to where no one knew but she. The memory of that picture has more than once kept me from straying too far from the place of purity and safety in which her arms held me. At a very early age I began to thump on the piano alone, and it was not long before I was able to pick out a few tunes. When I was seven years old I could play by ear all of the hymns and songs that my mother knew. I had also learned the names of the notes in both clefs, but I preferred not to be hampered by notes. About this time several ladies for whom my mother sewed heard me play, and they persuaded her that I should at once be put under a teacher. So arrangements were made for me to study the piano with a lady who was a fairly good musician. At the same time arrangements were made for me to study my books with this lady's daughter. My music teacher had no small difficulty at first in penning me down to the notes. If she played my lesson over for me, I invariably attempted to reproduce the required sounds without the slightest recourse to the written characters. Her daughter, my other teacher, also had her worries. She found that, in reading, whenever I came to words that were difficult or unfamiliar, I was prone to bring my imagination to the rescue and read from the picture. She has laughingly told me, since then, that I would sometimes substitute whole sentences and even paragraphs from what meaning I thought the illustrations conveyed. She said she sometimes was not only amused at the fresh treatment I would give an author's subject, but that when I gave some new and sudden turn to the plot of the story, she often grew interested and even excited in listening to hear what kind of denouement I would bring about. But I am sure this was not due to dullness, for I made rapid progress in both my music and my books. And so, for a couple of years, my life was divided between my music and my school books. Music took up the greater part of my time. I had no playmates, but amused myself with games, some of them my own invention, which could be played alone. I knew a few boys whom I had met at the church, which I attended with my mother, but I had formed no close friendships with any of them. Then, when I was nine years old, my mother decided to enter me in the public school, so all at once I found myself thrown among a crowd of boys of all sizes and kinds. Some of them seemed to me like savages. I shall never forget the bewilderment 
the pain, the heart-sickness of that first day at school. I seemed to be the only stranger in the place. Every other boy seemed to know every other boy. I was fortunate enough, however, to be, to be assigned to a teacher who knew me. My mother made her dresses. She was one of the ladies who used to pat me on the head and kiss me. She had the tact to address a few words directly to me. This gave me a certain sort of standing in the class, and put me somewhat at ease. Within a few days I had made one staunch friend, and was on fairly good terms with most of the boys. I was shy of the girls, and remained so. Even now a word or look from a pretty woman sets me all a-tremble. This friend I bound to me with hooks of steel in a very simple way. He was a big awkward boy, with a face full of freckles, and a head full of very red hair. He was perhaps fourteen years of age, that is, four or five years older than any other boy in the class. This seniority was due to the fact that he had spent twice the required amount of time in several of the preceding classes. I had not been at school many hours before I felt that Redhead, as I involuntarily called him, and I were to be friends. I do not doubt that this feeling was strengthened by the fact that I had been quick enough to see that a big, strong boy was a friend to be desired at a public school, and, perhaps, in spite of his dullness, Redhead had been able to discern that I could be of service to him. At any rate, there was simultaneous mutual attraction. The teacher had strung the class promiscuously round the walls of the room for a sort of trial heat for places of rank. When the line was straightened out, I found that by skillful maneuvering I had placed myself third, and had piloted Redhead to the place next to me. The teacher began by giving us to spell the words corresponding to our order in the line. Spell first, spell second, spell third. I rattled off T-H-I-R-D, third, in a way which said, Why don't you give us something hard? As the words went down the line, I could see how lucky I had been to get a good place together with an easy word. As young as I was, I felt impressed with the unfairness of the whole proceeding, when I saw the tail-enders going down before twelfth and twentieth and I felt sorry for those who had to spell such words in order to hold a low position. Spell forth. Redhead, with his hands clutched tightly behind his back, began bravely. F-O-R-T-H. Like a flash, a score of hands went up, and the teacher began saying, No snapping of fingers, no snapping of fingers. This was the first word missed and it seemed to me that some of the scholars were about to lose their senses. Some were dancing up and down on one foot with a hand above their heads, the fingers working furiously, and joy beaming all over their faces. Others stood still, their hands raised not so high, their fingers working less rapidly, and their faces expressing not quite so much happiness. There were still others who did not move, nor raise their hands, but stood with great wrinkles on their foreheads, looking very thoughtful. The whole thing was new to me, and I did not raise my hand, but slyly whispered the letter U to Redhead several times. Second chance, said the teacher. The hands went down, and the class became quiet. Redhead, his face now red, after looking beseechingly at the ceiling, then pitiably at the floor, began very haltingly, F, U, immediately an impulse to raise hands went through the class, but the teacher checked it, and poor Redhead, though he knew that each letter he added only took him farther out of the way, went doggedly on and finished, R, T, H. The hand raising was now repeated with more hubbub and excitement than at first. Those who before had not moved a finger were now waving their hands above their heads. Redhead felt that he was lost. He looked very big and foolish, and some of the scholars began to snicker. His helpless condition went straight to my heart, and gripped my sympathies. 
I felt that if he failed it would in some way be my failure. I raised my hand, and under cover of the excitement and the teacher's attempts to regain order, I hurriedly shot up into his ear twice, quite distinctly, F-O-U-R-T-H, F-O-U-R-T-H. The teacher tapped on her desk and said, Third and last chance. The hands came down. The silence became oppressive. Redhead began, F. Since that day, I have waited anxiously for many a turn of the wheel of fortune, but never under greater tension than I watched for the order in which those letters would fall from Red's lips. O. U. R. T. H. A sigh of relief and disappointment went up from the class. Afterwards, through all our school days, Redhead shared my wit and quickness, and I benefited by his strength and dogged faithfulness. There were some black and brown boys and girls in the school, and several of them were in my class. One of the boys strongly attracted my attention from the first day I saw him. His face was as black as night, but shone as though he was polished. He had sparkling eyes, and when he opened his mouth, he displayed glistening white teeth. It struck me at once as appropriate to call him Shiny Face, or Shiny Eyes, or Shiny Teeth. I spoke of him often by one of these names to the other boys. These terms were finally merged into Shiny, and to that name he answered good-naturedly during the balance of his public school days. Shiny was considered without question to be the best speller, the best reader, the best penman, in a word, the best scholar, in the class. He was very quick to catch anything, but nevertheless studied hard. Thus he possessed two powers very rarely combined in one boy. I saw him year after year, on up into the high school, when the majority of the prizes for punctuality, deportment, essay writing, and declamation. Yet it did not take me long to discover that in spite of his standing as a scholar, he was in some way looked down upon. The other black boys and girls were still more looked down upon. Some of the boys often spoke of them as niggers. Sometimes, on the way home from school, a crowd would walk behind them, repeating, Nigger, nigger, never die, black face and shiny eye. On one such occasion, one of the black boys turned suddenly on his tormentors and hurled a slate. It struck one of the white boys in the mouth, cutting a slight gash in his lip. At sight of the blood, the boy who had thrown the slate ran, and his companions quickly followed. We ran after them, pelting them with stones, until they separated in several directions. I was very much wrought up over the affair, and went home and told my mother how one of the niggers had struck a boy with a slate. I shall never forget how she turned on me. Don't you ever use that word again, she said, and don't you ever bother the colored children at school. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. I did hang my head in shame, but not because she had convinced me that I had done wrong, but because I was hurt by the first sharp word she had ever given me. My school days ran along very pleasantly. I stood well in my studies, not always so well with regard to my behavior. I was never guilty of any serious misconduct, but my love of fun sometimes got me into trouble. I remember, however, that my sense of humor was so sly that most of the trouble usually fell on the head of the other fellow. My ability to play on the piano at school exercises was looked upon as little short of marvelous in a boy of my age. I was not chummy with many of my mates, but on the whole was about as popular as it is good for a boy to be. One day near the end of my second term at school, the principal came into our room and after talking to the teacher, for some reason said, I wish all of the white scholars to stand for a moment. I rose with the others. The teacher looked at me, and, calling my name, said, You sit down for the present, and rise with the others. I did not quite understand her, and questioned, Ma'am? 
She repeated with a softer tone in her voice, You sit down now, and rise with the others. I sat down dazed. I saw and heard nothing. When the others were asked to rise, I did not know it. When school was dismissed, I went out in a kind of stupor. A few of the white boys jeered at me, saying, Oh, you're a nigger, too. I heard some black children say, We knew he was colored. Shiny said to them, Come along, don't tease him, and thereby won my undying gratitude. I hurried on as fast as I could, and had gone some distance before I perceived that Redhead was walking by my side. After a while he said to me, Let me carry your books. I gave him my strap without being able to answer. When we got to my gate, he said as he handed me my books, Say, you know my big red agate? I can't shoot with it any more. I'm going to bring it to school for you tomorrow. I took my books and ran into the house. As I passed through the hallway, I saw that my mother was busy with one of her customers. I rushed up into my own little room, shut the door, and went quickly to where my looking-glass hung on the wall. For an instant, I was afraid to look. But when I did, I looked long and earnestly. I had often heard people say to my mother, what a pretty boy you have. I was accustomed to hear remarks about my beauty, but now, for the first time, I became conscious of it and recognized it. I noticed the ivory whiteness of my skin, the beauty of my mouth, the size and liquid darkness of my eyes, and how the long black lashes that fringed and shaded them produced an effect that was strangely fascinating even to me. I noticed the softness and glossiness of my dark hair that fell in waves over my temples, making my forehead appear whiter than it really was. How long I stood there gazing at my image I do not know. When I came out and reached the head of the stairs, I heard the lady who had been with my mother going out. I ran downstairs and rushed to where my mother was sitting with a piece of work in her hands. I buried my head in her lap and blurted out, Mother! Mother, tell me, am I a nigger? I could not see her face, but I knew the piece of work dropped to the floor, and I felt her hands on my head. I looked up into her face and repeated, Tell me, mother, am I a nigger? There were tears in her eyes, and I could see that she was suffering for me. And then it was that I looked at her critically for the first time. I had thought of her in a childish way only as the most beautiful woman in the world. Now I looked at her, searching for defects. I could see that her skin was almost brown, that her hair was not so soft as mine, and that she did differ in some way from the other ladies who came to the house. Yet, even so, I could see that she was very beautiful, more beautiful than any of them. She must have felt that I was examining her for she hid her face in my hair, and said with difficulty, No, my darling, you are not a nigger. She went on, You are as good as anybody. If anyone calls you a nigger, don't notice them. But the more she talked, the less was I reassured, and I stopped her by asking, Well, mother, am I white? Are you white? She answered tremblingly, no, I am not white, but your father is one of the greatest men in the country. The best blood of the South is in you. This suddenly opened up in my heart a fresh chasm of misgiving and fear, and I almost fiercely demanded, Who is my father? Where is he? She stroked my hair and said, I'll tell you about him some day. I sobbed, I want to know now. She answered, No, not now. Perhaps it had to be done, but I have never forgiven the woman who did it so cruelly. It may be that she never knew that she gave me a sword thrust that day in school, which was years in healing. End of Chapter 1 The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man by James Weldon Johnson A Museum of Oriental Art by Lionel Gust 
Read by Bologna Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. A Museum of Oriental Art by Lionel Gust. The recent ever memorable visit of the King Emperor of India with the Queen Empress to his Indian dominions and their safe and happy return from their mission of good will and sympathy with the Oriental races under the sway of the British crown, have done much to bring home to the minds of thoughtful people at home the need for a better comprehension, an acquaintance something more than scholastic and exotic, with the habits, customs, religious observances, and artistic expression of the various races under the British flag. It seems to be generally accepted at home, as well as in India, that the personal visit of the King Emperor has done much towards providing an efficient means of breaking down the intellectual barriers between East and West. Although India must continue to be a dependency controlled by military force, it is not to this form of hegemony that one must look for the desired result. Even justice, administered by vigorous and impartial law, cannot be relied upon for supplying the milk of human sympathy in an alien race. Religion and the fine arts, being both in their different ways modes of expression of mankind's craving for the ideal, for some knowledge of the unknowable, some solution of the mysteries of good and evil, some approachment towards the end and object of all things, are perhaps the field on which Eastern and Western minds should be able to understand each other best. In spite of the intense and, perhaps, to some minds, hopeless antagonism between East and West at the present time, that the minds of thinkers and statesmen, even of leaders of religion, are not adverse from discussion and further instruction upon Oriental literature and teaching has been shown by the renewed demand for an extension of facilities for Oriental studies and the recognition of such studies as essential for the welfare of the British nation as perhaps the greatest Oriental power in the world. At this point it should be said that Oriental studies must be held to cover the whole field of Asia in addition to India and its diverse races. Persia, Tibet, China, Japan, are all emanations of distinct but allied lines of intellectual development and human progress, while the whole story of the religion of Islam as a working power in the history of the world in more than one continent demands more knowledge and attention than is at present given to it in this country. The recent expeditions to Chinese Turkestan, German and French, though promoted by British enterprise, have revealed treasures of artistic and literary knowledge, and have thrown much light upon the interdependence of Chinese and Indian art and thought. Attention has been drawn in the Burlington Magazine to the valuable results already obtained from the discoveries of Dr. Oral Stein and M. Pelliot in Turkestan. It is surmised that similar expeditions in the unknown and inhospitable region of Tibet might lead to discoveries of equal worth. The writings of Dr. Ananda Kumara Swami, of which a valuable example is contributed to this number of the magazine, have thrown a new light upon the history of painting in India, a subject already illuminated by the patient research and acumen of Mrs. Herringham. Mr. Havel and others have contributed to the same cause. Mr. Lawrence Binion, of the British Museum, has taken up the task of expounding to the British audiences the history and the meaning of the fine arts in the Far East. One need only walk down Bond Street and St. James Street to become aware how assertive in the market have become the wares of the Far East in ceramics and textiles, even in painting and sculpture. What has been, and is still the official attitude, towards Oriental art? What steps must the student of Oriental art, fresh from the wonderful organizations in Berlin, Paris, and elsewhere on the continent, take to pursue his researches in London? 
he is aware that the british nation possesses treasures of oriental art of surpassing interest but where is he to find them well he must be told that he must go to the british museum and on the main staircase he will find the sculptures from the famous amaravati tope but he must not expect to find any other examples of indian or oriental sculpture in that institution if he wishes to study chinese and japanese painting he must go to the department of prints and drawings but if he wishes to study chinese and japanese printed books he must go to a special section of the library downstairs if he wishes to study persian paintings and manuscripts he must go to yet another department in the museum that of manuscripts if he be working on ethnological lines he will find much to interest him connected with aboriginal and savage races of either hemisphere but little of real use to him relating to the more highly developed civilizations of the far east in most cases he will be advised to complete his studies by a visit to the victoria and albert museum let us follow him there the student will probably make his way first to the indian museum or more strictly speaking that section of the victoria and albert museum which is set apart by the board of education for the exhibition of certain industries practiced at the present day in india in this part of the museum which he will probably have entirely to himself he will find an interesting but quite uninstructive exhibition of certain industrial products of india textiles joinery ceramics all arranged according to a hide-bound system of classification by subject without much reference to the intellectual racial climatic or any other circumstances which have governed the progress and produce of these industries the products of send of rajputana of bengal of madras of nepal and even of tibet are classified together under subject quite regardless of geographical or racial distinctions this unfortunate state of affairs is brought about by our national disease of compromise the middle course whereby the regulations insisted upon by the board of education are adhered to on the one hand and the equally insistent demands of the indian government are met on the other resulting in complete negation of any satisfactory result other than salving the amour propre of each department of the state our student however may wish to pursue the study of ceramics further and will be told that he must cross the road and look for chinese japanese and persian ceramics in the main collection of the victoria and albert museum bearing always in mind that an important section of national property in the case of oriental ceramics is to be found in the british museum if he wishes to study embroidery he must hunt for oriental examples other than indian in yet another department if he wishes to study architecture and the plastic arts it will be difficult to instruct him exactly what to do and he may run some risk of being recommended just as doctors recommend a long sea voyage to a tiresome patient to try the imperial institute and the bethnal green museum if it be once recognized that the arts of the far east have been and are still being evolved out of a continuous progression of human thought and intellectual expression derived more directly from primitive civilizations than the arts of the west and rarely influenced at any time by these western arts with advantage to either side it will be understood how necessary it must be to have a museum of oriental art alone in direct connection with an institute for oriental studies if it be also recognized that all our own traditions of religion our very race history the foundations of our european languages are traceable by common acceptance and in many cases by actual proof to an asiatic source we should feel conscious of a greater debt to asiatic intelligence than we have ever even attempted to pay 
there is no need for controversy no need for antagonism between christianity on the one hand and islam buddhism and hinduism on the other between the canons and ideals of western art as derived from the pure intellectual atmosphere of hellas and the more turbid streams of art in persia india or china the establishment of a national school of oriental studies with a great museum of oriental art attached to it would be proof not only of the importance of the position of the british empire as an oriental power but of that simple blending of this power with human sympathy and good will which was lately symbolized by the figure of the king emperor in person on his throne at delhi End of a Museum of Oriental Art by Lionel Gust An Analogy from New Conscience and an Ancient Evil by Jane Addams Read by Bologna Times This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. An Analogy In every large city throughout the world, thousands of women are so set aside as outcasts from decent society that it is considered an impropriety to speak the very word which designates them. Lecky calls this type of woman the most mournful and the most awful figure in history. He says that she remains while creeds and civilizations rise and fall, and the eternal sacrifice of humanity blasted for the sins of the people. But evils so old that they are embedded in man's earliest history have been known to sway before an enlightened public opinion, and in the end to give way to a growing conscience, which regards them first as a moral affront and at length as an utter impossibility. Thus the generation just before us, our own fathers, uprooted the enormous opus of slavery, the tree that was literally as old as the race of man, although slavery doubtless had its beginnings in the captives of man's earliest warfare, even as this existing evil thus originated. Those of us who think we discern the beginnings of a new conscience in regard to this twin of slavery as old and outrageous as slavery itself, and even more persistent, find a possible analogy between certain civic, philanthropic, and educational efforts directed against the very existence of this social evil, and similar organized efforts which preceded the overthrow of slavery in America. Thus, long before slavery was finally declared illegal, there were international regulations of its traffic, state and federal legislation concerning its extension, and many extra-legal attempts to control its abuses. Quite as we have the international regulations concerning the white slave traffic, the state and interstate legislation for its repression, and an extra-legal power in connection with it so universally given to the municipal police that the possession of this power has become one of the great sources of corruption in every American city. Before society was ready to proceed against the institution of slavery, as such, groups of men and women, by means of the Underground Railroad, cherished and educated individual slaves. It is scarcely necessary to point out the similarity to the rescue homes and preventive associations which every great city contains. It is always easy to overwork an analogy, and yet the economist who, for years, insisted that slave labor continually and arbitrarily limited the wages of free labor, and was therefore a detriment to national wealth, was a forerunner of the economist of today, who points out the economic basis of the social evil, the connection between low wages and despair, between over-fatigue and the demand for reckless pleasure. Before the American nation agreed to regard slavery as unjustifiable from the standpoint of public morality, an army of reformers, lecturers, and writers set forth its enormity in a never-ceasing flow of invective, of appeal, and of portrayal concerning the human cruelty to which the system lent itself. 
we can discern the scouts and outposts of a similar army advancing against this existing evil. The physicians and sanitarians who are committed to the task of ridding the race from contagious diseases, the teachers and lecturers who are appealing to the higher morality of thousands of young people, the growing literature, not only biological and didactic, but of a popular type more closely approaching Uncle Tom's Cabin. Throughout the agitation for the abolition of slavery in America, there were statesmen who gradually became convinced of the political and moral necessity of giving to the freedmen the protection of the ballot. In this current agitation, there are at least a few men and women who would extend a greater social and political freedom to all women if only because domestic control has proved so ineffectual. We may certainly take courage from the fact that our contemporaries are fired by social compassions and enthusiasms, to which even our immediate predecessors were indifferent. Such compunctions have ever manifested themselves in varying degrees of ardor through different groups in the same community. Thus, among those who are newly aroused to action in regard to the social evil, are many who would endeavor to regulate it and believe they can minimize its dangers, still larger numbers who would eliminate all trafficking of unwilling victims in connection with it, and yet others who believe that as a quasi-legal institution it may be absolutely abolished. Perhaps the analogy to the abolition of slavery is most striking in that these groups, in their varying points of view, are like those earlier associations which differed widely in regard to chattel slavery. Only the so-called extremists, in the first instance, stood for abolition, and they were continually told that what they proposed was clearly impossible. The legal and commercial obstacles, bulked large, were placed before them, and it was confidently asserted that the blame for the historic existence of slavery lay deep within human nature itself. Yet gradually all of these associations reached the point of view of the abolitionists, and before the war was over, even the most lukewarm Unionists saw no other solution of the nation's difficulty. Some such gradual conversion to the point of view of abolition is the experience of every society or group of people who seriously face the difficulties and complications of the social evil. Certainly all the national organizations the National Vigilance Committee, the American Purity Federation, the Alliance for the Suppression and Prevention of the White Slave Traffic, and many others, stand for the final abolition of commercialized vice. Local vice commissions, such as the able one recently appointed in Chicago, although composed of members of varying beliefs in regard to the possibility of control and regulation, united in the end in recommending a law enforcement looking towards final abolition. Even the most skeptical of Chicago citizens, after reading the fearless document, shared the hope of the commission that, quote, the city, when aroused to the truth, would instantly rebel against the social evil in all its phases, unquote. A similar recommendation of ultimate abolition was recently made unanimous by the Minneapolis Vice Commission after the conversion of many of its members. Doubtless all of the national societies have before them a task only less gigantic than that faced by those early associations in America for the suppression of slavery, although it may be legitimate to remind them that the best-known anti-slavery society in America was organized by the New England abolitionists in 1836, and only 36 years later, in 1872, was formally disbanded because its object had been accomplished. The long struggle ahead of these newer associations will doubtless claim its martyrs and its heroes, has indeed already claimed them during the last thirty years. Few righteous causes have escaped baptism with blood, Nevertheless, to paraphrase Lincoln's speech, if blood were exacted drop by drop in measure to the tears of anguished mothers and enslaved girls, 
the nation would still be obliged to go into the struggle. Throughout this volume, the phrase social evil is used to designate the sexual commerce permitted to exist in every large city, usually in a segregated district, wherein the chastity of women is bought and sold. Modifications of legal codes regarding marriage and divorce, moral judgments, concerning the entire group of questions centering about illicit affection between men and women are quite other questions which are not considered here. Such problems must always remain distinct from those of commercialized vice, as must the treatment of an irreducible minimum of prostitution, which will doubtless long exist, quite as society still retains an irreducible minimum of murders. This volume does not deal with the probable future of prostitution, and gives only such historical background as is necessary to understand the present situation. It endeavors to present the contributory causes as they have become registered in my consciousness through a long residence in a crowded city quarter, and to state the indications, as I have seen them, of a new conscience with its many and varied manifestations. Nothing is gained by making the situation better or worse than it is, nor in any wise different from what it is. This ancient evil is indeed social in the sense of community responsibility, and can only be understood and at length remedied when we face the fact and measure the resources which may at length be massed against it. Perhaps the most striking indication that our generation has become the bearer of a new moral consciousness in regard to the existence of commercialized vice is the fact that the mere contemplation of it throws the more sensitive men and women among our contemporaries into a state of indignant revolt. It is doubtless an instinctive shrinking from this emotion and an unconscious dread that this modern sensitiveness will be outraged which justifies to themselves so many moral men and women in their persistent ignorance of the subject. Yet, one of the most obvious resources at our command, which might well be utilized at once, if it is to be utilized at all, is the overwhelming pity and sense of protection which the recent revelations in the white slave traffic have aroused for the thousands of young girls, many of them still children, who are yearly sacrificed to the quote, sins of the people. Unquote. All of this emotion ought to be made of value, for quite as a state of emotion is invariably the organic preparation for action, so it is certainly true that no profound spiritual transformation can take place without it. After all, human progress is deeply indebted to a study of imperfections, and the counsels of despair, if not full of seasoned wisdom, are at least fertile in suggestion and a desperate spur to action. Sympathetic knowledge is the only way of approach to any human problem, and the line of least resistance into the jungle of human wretchedness must always be through that region which is most thoroughly explored, not only by the information of the statistician, but by sympathetic understanding. We are daily attaining the latter through such authors as Sutterman and Elsa Jerusalem, who have enabled their readers to comprehend the so-called fallen woman through a skillful portrayal of the reaction of experience upon personality. Their realism has rescued her from the sentimentality surrounding an impossible Camille quite as their fellow craftsmen in realism have replaced the weeping Amelias of the Victorian period by reasonable women transcribed from actual life. The treatment of the subject in American literature is at present in the pamphleteering stage, although an ever-increasing number of short stories and novels deal with it. On the other hand, the plays through which Bernard Shaw constantly places the truth before the public in England, as Brew is doing for the public in France, produce in the spectators a disquieting sense that society is involved in commercialized vice and must speedily find a way out. Such writing is like the roll of the drum, which announces the approach of the troops ready for action. 
Some of the writers who are performing this valiant service are related to those great artists who, in every age, enter into a long struggle with existing social conditions, until after many years they change the outlook upon life for at least a handful of their contemporaries. Their readers find themselves no longer mere bewildered spectators of a given social wrong, but have become conscious of their own hypocrisy in regard to it, and they realize that a veritable horror, simply because it was hidden, had come to seem to them inevitable and almost normal. Many traces of this first uneasy consciousness regarding the social evil are found in contemporary literature, for while the business of literature is revelation and not reformation, it may yet perform for the men and women now living that purification of the imagination and intellect which the Greeks believed to come through pity and terror. Secure in the knowledge of evolutionary processes, we have learned to talk glibly of the obligations of race progress and of the possibility of racial degeneration. In this respect, certainly, we have a wider outlook than that possessed by our fathers, who so valiantly grappled with chattel slavery and secured its overthrow. May the new conscience gather force until men and women, acting under its sway, shall be constrained to eradicate this ancient evil. End of An Analogy by Jane Addams The Awakening of Spring by Sarah Barnwell Elliott From The Drama Magazine, A Quarterly Review, Issue Number 5, February 1912 Reading by Bologna Times This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Awakening of Spring This play, if that can be called a play which does not know the unities, which has neither plot nor climax, which is simply a series of accidental catastrophes, this bit of writing, then, which might better be called a conjuries of calamities, the subtitle of which is A Tragedy of Childhood, is translated from the German of Frank Wiedekin by Francis J. Ziegler, who prepares one more or less for the play with twelve pages written by himself, and called a proem for prudes. This proem is very necessary and very enlightening, for, besides deprecating in almost every sentence the criticism of said prudes, this proem gives an appreciation, so to speak, of Mr. Weedkin and his work. Mr. Ziegler says of Weedkin, his name is just beginning to be heard in America. In Germany, he has been recognized for some time as one of the leaders in the new art of the theater. Naturally enough, his plays are too outspoken in their realism to appeal to all his fellow countrymen. But if certain Germans reject this mental pablum, others become intoxicated by it, and, waxing enthusiastic with a flow of language almost bacchic, Hale Weedkin as the forerunner of a new drama, as a power destined to infuse fresh strength into the German stage. With this strength in its body, writes one admirer, the public will never more endure lyrical lemonade, nor the dregs of dramatic penury. Mr. Ziegler goes on. Weedkin, it is true, has a habit of using the news of the day as material for his plays, just as the old English dramatists did when they wrote domestic tragedies. He has a fondness, moreover, for gruesome situations, but of the childlike simplicity which marks much of the Elizabethan drama there is not a particle. Mr. Ziegler says further that his author has no trace of the gentle romanticism of Hoffman or of even the iconoclast Strindberg. But when Weedkin departs from pure realism, his fancy creates a gothic nightmare of horrors. We are then introduced to a synopsis of the work of this author, after which one does not feel, so to say, 
eager to pursue the study of Mr. Weedkin, save perhaps as a part of the business of keeping up with the procession. Mr. Ziegler admits that the playwright has attacked his theme with European frankness, which is quite true. Mr. Ziegler admits also that Weedkin has been accused of depicting his adults as too ignorant and too indifferent to the needs of the younger generation. Mr. Ziegler might have added that these adults were depicted also as being singularly stupid and the younger generation as being singularly degenerate, far more so, let us hope, than is usual with physically healthy children, as the children in this play seem to be. Of course, all understand that the playwright, in order to drive home the lesson he seems to think necessary, has focused not only all the ills of early youth, but all the possible ills, and such a method will make an awful picture of any season of life or state of being. Mercifully for humanity, all the ills seldom accumulate on one person, or group of persons, at one and the same time. One is a trifle saddened, however, when a little further on, Mr. Ziegler reports that this play has, in Berlin, become part of the regular stock of plays acted at Das Neue Theater, where it is said to be certain of drawing a crowded audience. Later, Mr. Ziegler comforts us a little as to German taste and thought by explaining that, in order to estimate the relationship of this play toward modern thought in Germany, it must be understood that Weedkin's tragedy is merely one of the documents in a paper war which has resulted at last in having the physiology of sex taught in many German schools. War measures, we find in history, are usually to be apologized for, but not repeated, in times of peace. However all this may be, if it be deemed necessary to tell all to children, why should not the fathers and mothers undertake this more or less disagreeable task? Why need the public be dragged in to assist at this function? Do not fathers remember enough of their boyhood, and mothers enough of their girlhood, to guard their children either by explanation or by watching? If a man or woman has married a degenerate, is not he or she capable of watching for the same in the children, and training it out of said children? In short, is there no private method of doing these things? Not making them private because of any innate wickedness in things natural of any prudery in audience or reader, but simply on the ground of the unpleasantness of the subject. Many physical things are unpleasant, and so are kept decently in the background. Why not the subject discussed so very frankly in The Awakening of Spring? Are we not sufficiently afflicted with nauseating horrors in the pages of the daily press, the source, we are told, of Mr. Weedkin's inspiration? Are not the medical advertisements with the attached pictures of the dreadful-looking people who have been cured of various unspeakable diseases, people so very ugly that on aesthetic grounds they should have been let die at once, are not these things a sufficient punishment? Has not humanity to endure many of these physical, mental, and moral horrors in their own persons, and is not this enough without having, in addition, to meet them in literature on the stage, and consequently in everyday talk? Has Mr. Ziegler done anything toward the uplift of the country, or toward the gaiety of nations by this translation? Does he think that already America has become what it bids fair to become, a people so mongrel that degeneracy will be the common inheritance? One more word of comfort we find in the proem to Prudes. Mr. Ziegler says, As a play, The Awakening of Spring stands unique in the annals of dramatic art. As the old darkies say, Glory be! End of The Awakening of Spring by Sarah Barnwell Elliott The Birth of Tecumseh From The Story of Tecumseh by Norman S. Gerd This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
Reading by Bologna Times The Birth of Tecumseh by Norman S. Gerd. In the latter part of the 18th century, there stood on the banks of the Mad River, a tributary of the Ohio, about seven miles below the site of the present city of Springfield, a village of the Chihuahua Indians called Piqua. This village had been built on the site of an ancient Indian town known as Chalicothe. Near the river, the banks of which at this point were about twenty feet high, stood a rude fort, built of logs and surrounded by a stockade of cedar pickets. Outside the stockade were grouped the huts and wigwams of the inhabitants, and surrounding the village were the cornfields and orchards. Looking to the southward, there met the eye a stretch of prairie land hemmed in by the forest. On this prairie roamed occasional herds of buffalo, wanderers from the great plains of the west. Deer and antelope were to be seen in great numbers, feeding on the rich prairie grass. Beyond the village to the westward lay the unbroken forest. On the north the land was rough and broken, rising abruptly into rocky cliffs. Here and there a dwarfed cedar or pine clung to the face of the precipice with gnarled and twisted roots, or a hardy vine hung its green curtain over the naked rock. To the eastward ran the mad river in its impetuous descent to the Ohio. Amid these scenes the young Tecumseh was born in the year 1768. His father, Pakeshenwa, was a chief of the Kiskapoke, and his mother, Metbowataski, a member of the Turtle Band, both clans of the Shawano tribe, which was itself a sub-tribe of the great Algonquin nation. The name, Tecumseh, the primary meaning of which is a panther springing upon its prey, also signifies a shooting star. The vivid imagination of the Indians picturing a falling star as the panther of the sky. Tecumseh was the fourth child, and three other children were born after him. Chisika, the eldest of the family, achieved some fame as a warrior. Laliwasika, later known as the Prophet, was closely associated with Tecumseh throughout his life. Of the other members of the family, little is known save their names. According to the Indian custom, the young Tecumseh, immediately after his birth, was placed in a sack made of soft deerskin, laced up the front with leather thongs, and decorated with embroidery of colored quills. This was strapped to a flat board, having a wooden bow extending over the infant's head. Even though she was the wife of the chief, Tecumseh's mother had little time to devote to her child. She must gather firewood, prepare and cook the food brought in by the hunters, make and mend the deerskin clothing and moccasins, cure the skins of deer and other animals, and sow and cultivate and reap their little harvest of Indian corn. For the first year of his life, the little Tecumseh was carried about by his mother in the odd little cradle strapped to her back. When she worked in the fields, she would place the cradle against a tree, or pass the loop over a branch so that the cradle might swing to and fro in the breeze. After the lad was a year old, he was fed on soup made of venison or fish, thickened with wild rice or corn. In the fall, the Indian women gathered the rice and stored it for food during the long winter months. Paddling their canoes into the marsh, they would pull the rice stalks over the side and thresh out the grain with the paddles into the bottom until the frail crafts were loaded as deep as safely permitted. Thousands of wild ducks came to feed on the rice. Disturbed by the canoes, they rose their wings sounding like thunder, and whirling in the air betook themselves to the deeper solitudes of the marshes. Passenger pigeons, 
flew northward in the spring, and returned southward again in the fall, in such vast numbers that the sun was darkened at midday. It was a very wonderful and interesting world to the young Tecumseh. He was soon able to run about the village and to ask countless questions about everything he saw or heard. His school days had begun, yet he did not study out of books. His teachers were his parents and elder brothers. From them he learned the names of the plants and trees, and how they were useful to man. He learned, too, the names of the animals and their habits. Walking through the woods, his father would tell him what animals had passed, and how long since they had gone by. It was easy to read the tracks in the snow, but hard to decipher the trail in the summer woods. He learned, quote, how the beavers built their lodges, where the squirrels hid their acorns, how the red deer ran so swiftly, why the rabbit was so timid, unquote. Of the birds, he, quote, learned their names and all their secrets, how they built their nests in summer, where they hid themselves in winter, unquote. Like all Indian children, Tecumseh had to shift more or less for himself. In and out through the village he went, swimming in the river, creeping through the forest in some mimic war-play, watching the building of canoes, greeting the hunters on their return from the chase here, there, and everywhere, full of the boundless energy which goes with a happy heart in a strong and healthy young body. He watched the women stretching the fresh skins of the deer, flesh side uppermost, on the ground by pegs driven in the edges. He saw them scrape off the fat and rub in salt to preserve the skin, and the brains of the animal to make the leather soft and pliable. Thus he learned how the animals supplied him with clothing as well as food. He joined the other boys in their play, shooting his tiny arrows at the birds and squirrels, or, what he liked best of all, playing at war. In the winter evenings, as he sat by the fire, wrapped in warm furs, listening to the howling of the north wind through the forest, his mother would tell him old Indian tales and legends. She told him that long ago the world was covered with water, so that not even the highest hills were visible. Wisukotik, who was a great magician, saved himself from the flood by building a raft. The beaver, the otter, and the muskrat climbed upon the raft. Wisukotik said to the beaver, Go down to the bottom and see if you can bring up a little earth. The beaver dived deep under the water, and after a long time came to the surface dead. Then Wisukotik said to the otter, Go down to the bottom and see if you can bring up a little earth. But the otter, too, came up and floated dead on the water. Then Wisukatik said to the little muskrat, Go down to the bottom and see if you can bring up a little earth. The muskrat remained under the water a very long time, and when he came up, he too was dead, but in his claws was a little mud. Then Wisukatik restored the three animals to life, and taking the mud brought up by the muskrat, rolled it into a little ball, and laid it on the raft. He then blew upon it, and the ball became very large. Then Wisukatik said to the wolf, My brother, run around the world, and see how large it is. The wolf ran around the world, and after a long time came back, and said, The world is very large. But Wisukatik thought that the world was still too small, so he blew again, and made it much larger. Then he said to the crow, Fly around the world, and see how large it is. But the crow never came back, so Wisukatik decided that the world was large enough. The little Tecumseh watched the flashing northern lights in the cold winter sky. His mother told him, that these were the spirits of the departed, dancing the ghost dances, as they journeyed to the happy hunting grounds. 
He loved to hear the old, old Indian fairy tale of Shingabis, the brave little duck. Shingabis lived in a tiny wigwam near a northern lake. He prepared four logs that he might have fire in his lodge through the four cold winter months, one log for each month. Every morning Shingahis left his left his lodge and went out on the frozen lake. When he came to the rushes, he pulled them out with his strong bill, and diving through the hole in the ice, caught many fish. The north wind watched Shingabus, and was angry to see how little he cared for the cold. So the north wind blew stronger and stronger, and sent the snow to cover the land deeper and deeper. Yet Shingabus was not frightened, but caught fish as before. Then the north wind was still more angry. He came himself and stood at the doorway of Shingabus's lodge, and the biting air crept in, and the wigwam crackled with the cold. But Shingabus only laughed and stirred the fire, saying, Wendy God, I know your plan. You are but my fellow man. Blow you may your coldest breeze, Shingabus you cannot freeze. Sweep the strongest wind you can, Shingabus is still your man. Hey, for life! And ho for bliss, who so free is Shingabus? Then the north wind came into the wigwam and sat by the fire, but little Shingabus did not seem to notice him. He only stirred the fire till the flames leapt up in the air, and sang more loudly his brave little song. Presently it was too hot for the north wind, so he left the lodge and went away. At night. When Tecumseh lay sleepless, looking up through the smoke hole in the wigwam at the stars twinkling in the sky, he thought of brave little Shingabis. Even when he was frightened, he did not cry at night. His mother had told him that bad Indians might hear him and come out of the dark forest. The hoot of an owl might be the signal to hidden foes. He never heard it at night without a quickened beating of the heart. The night breeze laden with the scent of the sleeping woods, softly moving the flap of the wigwam, startled him, but he made no outcry. Was he not the son of a chief, and was he not to be a great warrior himself? So he would fall asleep, to be awakened by the early rays of the sun, and the stir of life about the camp. End of The Birth of Tecumseh by Norman Esgerd Appearance and Reality from The Problems of Philosophy by Bertrand Russell Read by Bologna Times This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Appearance and Reality by Bertrand Russell Is there any knowledge in the world which is so certain that no reasonable man could doubt it? This question, which at first sight might not seem difficult, is really one of the most difficult that can be asked. When we have realized the obstacles in the way of a straightforward and confident answer, we shall be well launched on the study of philosophy, for philosophy is merely the attempt to answer such ultimate questions, not carelessly and dogmatically, as we do in ordinary life and even in the sciences but critically, after exploring all that makes such questions puzzling, and after realizing all the vagueness and confusion that underlie our ordinary ideas. In daily life we assume as certain many things which, on a closer scrutiny, are found to be so full of apparent contradictions that only a great amount of thought enables us to know what it is that we really may believe. In the search for certainty, it is natural to begin with our present experiences, and in some sense, no doubt, knowledge is to be derived from them. But any statement as to what it is that our immediate experiences make us know is very likely to be wrong. It seems to me that I am now sitting in a chair, at a table of a certain shape, on which I see sheets of paper with writing or print. 
By turning my head, I see out the window, buildings and clouds, and the sun. I believe that the sun is about 93 million miles from the earth, that it is a hot globe many times bigger than the earth, that, owing to the earth's rotation, it rises every morning, and will continue to do so for an indefinite time in the future. I believe that, if any other normal person comes into my room, he will see the same chairs and tables and books and papers as I see, and that the table which I see is the same as the table which I feel pressing against my arm. All this seems to be so evident as to be hardly worth stating, except in answer to a man who doubts whether I know anything. Yet all this may be reasonably doubted, and all of it requires much careful discussion before we can be sure that we have stated it in a form that is wholly true. To make our difficulties plain, let us concentrate attention on the table. To the eye it is oblong, brown, and shiny. To the touch it is smooth and cool and hard. When I tap it, it gives out a wooden sound. Anyone else who sees and feels and hears the table will agree with this description, so that it might seem as if no difficulty would arise. But as soon as we try to be more precise, our troubles begin. Although I believe that the table is really of the same color all over, the parts that reflect the light look much brighter than the other parts, and some parts look white because of reflected light. I know that if I move, the parts that reflect the light will be different, so that the apparent distribution of colors on the table will change. It follows that if several people are looking at the table at the same moment, no two of them will see exactly the same distribution of colors, because no two can see it from exactly the same point of view, and any change in the point of view makes some change in the way the light is reflected. For most practical purposes, these differences are unimportant, but to the painter they are all important. The painter has to unlearn the habit of thinking that things seem to have the color which common sense says they really have, and to learn the habit of seeing things as they appear. Here we have already the beginning of one of the distinctions that cause most trouble in philosophy, the distinction between appearance, and reality, between what things seem to be and what they are. The painter wants to know what things seem to be. The practical man and the philosopher want to know what they are, but the philosopher's wish to know this is stronger than the practical man's, and is more troubled by knowledge as to the difficulties of answering the question. To return to the table. It is evident from what we have found that there is no color which preeminently appears to be the color of the table, or even of one particular part of the table. It appears to be of different colors from different points of view, and there is no reason for regarding some of these as more really its color than others, and we know that even from a given point of view the color will seem different by artificial light or to a color-blind man, or to a man wearing blue spectacles, while in the dark there will be no color at all, though to touch and hearing the table will be unchanged. The color is not something which is inherent in the table, but something depending upon the table and the spectator and the way the light falls on the table. When, in ordinary life, we speak of the color of the table, we only mean the sort of color which it will seem to have to a normal spectator from an ordinary point of view under usual conditions of light. But the other colors which appear under other conditions have just as good a right to be considered real, and therefore, to avoid favoritism, we are compelled to deny that, in itself, the table has any one particular color. The same thing applies to the texture. With the naked eye, one can see the grain, 
but otherwise the table looks smooth and even. If we looked at it through a microscope, we should see roughnesses and hills and valleys and all sorts of differences that are imperceptible to the naked eye. Which of these is the real table? We are naturally tempted to say that what we see through the microscope is more real, but that in turn would be changed by a still more powerful microscope. If, then, we cannot trust what we see with the naked eye, why should we trust what we see through a microscope? Thus, again, the confidence in our senses with which we began deserts us. The shape of the table is no better. We are all in the habit of judging as to the real shapes of things, and we do this so unreflectingly that we come to think we actually see the real shapes. But in fact, as we all have to learn, if we try to draw, a given thing looks different in shape from every different point of view. If our table is really rectangular, it will look, from almost all points of view, as if it had two acute angles and two obtuse angles. If opposite sides are parallel, they will look as if they converge to a point away from the spectator. If they are of equal length, they will look as if the nearer side were longer. All these things are not commonly noticed in looking at a table, because experience has taught us to construct the real shape from the apparent shape, and the real shape is what interests us as practical men. But the real shape is not what we see. It is something inferred from what we see. And what we see is constantly changing in shape as we move about the room, so that here, again, the senses seem not to give us the truth about the table itself, but only about the appearance of the table. Similar difficulties arise when we consider the sense of touch. It is true that the table always gives us a sensation of hardness, and we feel it resists pressure, but the sensation we obtain depends upon how hard we press the table, and also upon what part of the body we press with. Thus, the various sensations, due to various pressures, or various parts of the body, cannot be supposed to reveal, directly, any definite property of the table, but at most to be signs of some property which, perhaps, causes all the sensations, but is not actually apparent in any of them, and the same applies, still more obviously, to the sounds which can be elicited by rapping the table. Thus it becomes evident that the real table, if there is one, is not the same as what we immediately experience by sight or touch or hearing. The real table, if there is one, is not immediately known to us at all, but must be an inference from what is immediately known. Hence, two very difficult questions at once arise, namely, 1. Is there a real table at all? 2. If so, what sort of object can it be? It will help us in considering these questions to have a, to have a few simple terms of which the meaning is definite and clear. Let us give the name of sense data to the things that are immediately known in sensation such things as colors, sounds, smells, hardnesses, roughnesses, and so on. We shall give the name sensation to the experience of being immediately aware of these things. Thus, whenever we see a color, we have a sensation of the color, but the color itself is a sense datum, not a sensation. The color is that of which we are immediately aware, and the awareness itself is the sensation. It is plain that if we are to know anything about the table, it must be by means of the sense data, brown color, oblong shape, smoothness, etc., which we associate with the table. But for the reasons which have been given, we cannot say that the table is the sense data or even that the sense data are directly properties of the table. 
Thus, a problem arises as to the relation of the sense data to the real table, supposing there is such a thing. The real table, if it exists, we will call a physical object. Thus we have to consider the relation of sense data to physical objects. The collection of all physical objects is called matter. Thus our two questions may be restated as follows. 1. Is there any such thing as matter? 2. If so, what is its nature? The philosopher who first brought prominently forward the reasons for regarding the, the immediate objects of our senses as not existing independently of us was Bishop Berkeley, 1685 through 1753. His three dialogues between Hylas and Philonus, in opposition to skeptics and atheists, undertake to prove that there is no such thing as matter at all and that the world consists of nothing but minds and their ideas. Hylas has hitherto believed in matter, but he is no match for Philonus, who mercilessly drives him into contradictions and paradoxes, and makes his own denial of matter seem, in the end, as if it were almost common sense. The arguments employed are of very different value. Some are important and sound, Others are confused or quibbling. But Berkeley retains the merit of having shown that the existence of matter is capable of being denied without absurdity, and that if there are any things that exist independently of us, they cannot be the immediate objects of our sensations. There are two different questions involved when we ask whether matter exists, and it is important to keep them clear. We commonly mean by matter something which is opposed to mind, something which we think of as occupying space and as radically incapable of any sort of thought or consciousness. It is chiefly in this sense that Berkeley denies matter. That is to say, he does not deny that the sense data which we commonly take as signs of the existence of the table are really signs of the existence of something independent of us, but he does deny that this something is non-mental, that it is neither mind nor ideas entertained by some mind. He admits that there must be something which continues to exist when we go out of the room or shut our eyes and that what we call seeing the table does really give us reason for believing in something which persists even when we are not seeing it. But he thinks that the something cannot be radically different in nature from what we see, and cannot be independent of seeing altogether, though it must be independent of our seeing. He is thus led to regard the real table as an idea in the mind of God, such an idea has the required permanence and independence of ourselves, without being, as matter would otherwise be, something quite unknowable, in the sense that we can only infer it, and can never be directly and immediately aware of it. Other philosophers since Berkeley have also held that, although the table does not depend for its existence upon being seen by me, it does depend on being seen or otherwise apprehended in sensation, by some mind, not necessarily the mind of God, but more often the whole collective mind of the universe. This they hold, as Berkeley does, chiefly because they think there can be nothing real, or at any rate nothing known to be real except minds and their thoughts and feelings. We might state the argument by which they support their view in some such way as this. Whatever can be thought of is an idea in the mind of the person thinking of it. Therefore nothing can be thought of except ideas in minds. Therefore anything else is inconceivable, and what is inconceivable cannot exist. Such an argument, in my opinion, is fallacious. And, of course, those who advance it do not put it so shortly or so crudely. But whether valid or not, the argument has been very widely advanced in one form or another, 
and very many philosophers, perhaps a majority, have held that there is nothing real except minds and their ideas. Such philosophers are called idealists. When they come to explaining matter, they either say, like Berkeley, that matter is really nothing but a collection of ideas, or they say, like Leibniz, 1646-1716, that what appears as matter is really a collection of more or less rudimentary minds. But these philosophers, though they deny matter as opposed to mind, nevertheless, in another sense, admit matter. It will be remembered that we asked two questions, namely, 1. Is there a real table at all? 2. If so, what sort of object can it be? Now, both Berkeley and Leibniz admit that there is a real table, but Berkeley says it is certain ideas in the mind of God, and Leibniz says it is a colony of souls. Thus both of them answer our first question in the affirmative, and only diverge from the views of ordinary mortals in their answer to our second question. In fact, almost all philosophers seem to be agreed that there is a real table. They almost all agree that however much our sense data, color, shape, smoothness, etc., may depend upon us, yet their occurrence is a sign of something existing independently of us, something differing, perhaps, completely from our sense data, and yet to be regarded as causing those sense data whenever we are in a suitable relation to the real table. Now, obviously, this point in which the philosophers are agreed, the view that there is a real table, whatever its nature may be, is vitally important, and it will be worth while to consider what reasons there are for accepting this view before we go on to the further question as to the nature of the real table. Our next chapter, therefore, will be concerned with the reasons for supposing that there is a real table at all. Before we go farther, it will be well to consider for a moment what it is that we have discovered so far. It has appeared that, if we take any common object of the sort that is supposed to be known by the senses, what the senses immediately tell us is not the truth about the object, as it is apart from us, but only the truth about certain sense data which, so far as we can see, depend upon the relations between us and the object. Thus, what we directly see and feel is merely appearance, which we believe to be a sign of some reality behind. But if the reality is not what appears, have we any means of knowing whether there is any reality at all? And if so, have we any means of finding out what it is like? Such questions are bewildering, and it is difficult to know that even the strangest hypotheses may not be true. Thus our familiar table, which has roused but the slightest thoughts in us hitherto, has become a problem full of surprising possibilities. The one thing we know about it is that it is not what it seems. Beyond this modest result, so far, we have the most complete liberty of conjecture. Leibniz tells us it is a community of souls. Berkeley tells us it is an idea in the mind of God. Sober science, scarcely less wonderful, tells us it is a vast collection of electric charges in violent motion. Among these surprising possibilities, doubt suggests that perhaps there is no table at all. Philosophy, if it cannot answer so many questions as we could wish, has at least the power of asking questions, which increase the interest of the world and show the strangeness and wonder lying just below the surface, even in the commonest things of daily life. End of Appearance and Reality by Bertrand Russell The Workers and the Church by Charles Summer from Topics of Today B. 
Busy Man's Canada, June 1912. Read by Bologna Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Workers in the Church by Charles Summer. London has just witnessed a remarkable midnight procession. Five hundred Anglican Church Socialists headed by Mr. George Lansbury, M.P., bearing a cross, and with the Reverend Conrad Knoll and the Countess of Warwick prominent in the ranks, marched from Westminster to the Archbishop's Palace at Lambeth to lay before His Grace a memorial expressing surprise and regret that the bishops had failed to take the side of the workers in the recent industrial troubles. The Archbishop was away and the memorial was accepted by his chaplain. The demonstration in front of the grand old pile, which has, for seven centuries, been the official home of the head of the Anglican Church, was on this occasion a peaceable one, but Lambeth Palace, in its time, has had to be defended from very hostile attacks. It is no new thing for the working classes to entertain the idea that His Grace of Canterbury has but little in common with the toilers. Lambeth Palace entertained, with magnificent hospitality, Plantagenet, Tudor, and Stuart kings. Queens Mary I, Elizabeth, Mary II, and Victoria visited the Archbishop and were received with great pomp. Let in the poor. The grand gates of Morton's Tower were gladly open to those who could smile royal favors, but only a very few years ago, since the days of Archbishop Benson, have the spacious and beautiful grounds of the palaces been open for the enjoyment of the poor of crowded and squalid Lambeth. The great library of Lambeth Palace, the great hall, the noble guard room, have been the scenes of many historic gatherings councils, and trials. Hard-fought battles over such questions as a priest's genuflections in front of an altar, the decoration of a vestment, or the position of a candlestick. But how comparatively seldom has Lambeth Palace, the home and office of the head of the church, been the scene of a conference for bettering the condition of the toiling poor? Garden parties, for the dwellers of the West End, have been many under the shadow of the Lollard's Tower. But it took years of agitation to convince the head of the church that the green and broad acres of Lambeth Palace, seldom used by His Grace of Canterbury, who had another beautiful palace at Addington, would be a boon and a blessing to the children of those who toiled in the potteries, the ironworks, and soap factories of murky Lambeth. Take the long line of archbishops, from Lanfranc in 1070 to Benson, and the courtiers who have held sway at Lambeth, who have far outnumbered those who have followed the master as a friend of the people. Names Spoken Reverently Lambeth has had a Stephen Langton, a Henry Chichley, a Whitgift a Tillotson, a Howley, and a Tate, names to be spoken with love and reverence. But some of these had hard work in doing good to atone for the mischief wrought by a lot who saw eye to eye, and worked hand in hand with those who tried to murder English liberty. The terms of the memorial to the present archbishop are not before me but it will not surprise any student of history to find the head of the english church reminded of his duty to those who toil lambeth has been the scene of a very peaceable demonstration but there have been episodes of violence in its history archbishop boniface quote, who had committed an outrage unquote, on the prior of st bartholomew's smithfield had to repel a regular siege by excited Londoners. The followers of Watt Tyler, who was not such an awful rebel as some historians have painted him, attacked the palace, and, to their honor, 
some five hundred london apprentices held a very hostile demonstration at lambeth against the obnoxious laud in seventeen eighty lambeth palace suffered from the followers of the fanatic lord george gordon and the archbishop and his family had to beat a hasty retreat across the river the present head of the church has but recently read the clergy a lecture on the signs of the times he has the wisdom to see that the church to hold its position must take cognizance of the problems of everyday life and that fact will certainly be brought home to him by the midnight visit of a band of people who although their methods are unconventional must have the excuse and be given the credit of being deadly in earnest give me the give me the money that has been spent in war and i will clothe every man woman and child in an entire of which kings and kings would be proud i will build a schoolhouse in every valley over the whole earth i will crown every hillside with a place of worship consecrated to the gospel of peace end of the workers and the church by charles summer some reminiscences by joseph conrad chapter one reading by bologna times this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain chapter one some reminiscences books may be written in all sorts of places verbal inspiration may enter the birth of a mariner on board a ship frozen fast in a river in the middle of a town and since saints are supposed to look benignantly on humble believers i indulge in the pleasant fancy that the shade of old flaubert who imagined himself to be among other things a descendant of vikings might have hovered with amused interest over the decks of the two thousand ton steamer called the adawa on board of which gripped by the inclement winter alongside a quay in rouen the tenth chapter of almayer's folly was begun with interest i say for was not the kind norman giant with enormous moustaches and a thundering voice the last of the romantics was he not in his unworldly almost ascetic devotion to his art a sort of literary saint-like hermit it has set at last said nina to her mother pointing to the hills behind which the sun had sunk these words of almayer's romantic daughter i remember tracing on the gray paper of a pad which rested on the blanket of my bed-place they referred to a sunset in malayan isles and shaped themselves in my mind in a hallucinated vision of forests and rivers and seas far removed from a commercial and yet romantic town of the northern hemisphere but at that moment the mood of visions and words was cut short by the third officer a cheerful and casual youth coming in with a bang of the door and the exclamation you've made it jolly warm here it was warm i had turned on the steam heater after placing a tin under the leaky watercock for perhaps you do not know that water will leak where steam will not i am not aware of what my young friend had been doing on deck all that morning but the hands he rubbed together vigorously were very red and imparted to me a chilly feeling by their mere aspect he has remained the only banjoist of my acquaintance and being also a younger son of a retired colonel the poem of mr kipling by a strange aberration of associated ideas always seems to me to have been written with an exclusive view to his person when he did not play the banjo he loved to sit and look at it he proceeded to this sentimental inspection and after meditating a while over the strings under my silent scrutiny inquired airily what are you always scribbling there if it's fair to ask it was a fair enough question but i did not answer him and simply turned the pad over with a movement of instinctive secrecy 
I could not have told him he had put to flight the psychology of Nina Almayer, her opening speech of the tenth chapter, and the words of Mrs. Almayer's wisdom, which were to follow in the ominous oncoming of a tropical night. I could not have told him that Nina had said, It has set at last. He would have been extremely surprised, and perhaps have dropped his precious banjo. Neither could I have told him that the sun of my sea-going was setting too. Even as I wrote the words expressing the impatience of passionate youth bent on its desire, I did not know this myself, and it is safe to say he would not have cared, though he was an excellent young fellow, and treated me with more deference than, in our relative positions, I was strictly entitled to. He lowered a tender gaze on his banjo, and I went on looking through the porthole. The round opening framed in its brass rim a fragment of the quays, with a row of casks ranged on the frozen ground and the tail end of a great cart. A red-nosed carter, in a blouse and woolen nightcap, leaned against the wheel. An idle, strolling custom-house guard, belted over his blue capote, had the air of being depressed by exposure to the weather and the monotony of official existence. The background of grimy houses found a place in the picture framed by my porthole, across a wide stretch of paved quay brown with frozen mud. The coloring was somber, and the most conspicuous feature was a little café with curtain windows and a shabby front of white woodwork, corresponding with the squalor of these poorer quarters bordering the river. We had been shifted down there from another berth in the neighborhood of the opera house, where that same porthole gave me a view of quite another sort of café, the best in town, I believe, and the very one where the worthy Bovary and his wife, the romantic daughter of old Père Renaud, had some refreshment after the memorable performance of an opera which was the tragic story of Lucia di Lammermoor in a setting of light music. I could recall no more the hallucination of the eastern archipelago, which I certainly hope to see again. The story of Almayer's folly got put away under the pillow for that day. I do not know that I had any occupation to keep me away from it. The truth of the matter is that on board that ship we were leading just then a contemplative life. I will not say anything of my privileged position. I was there just to oblige, as an actor of my standing may take a small part in the benefit performance of a friend. As far as my feelings were concerned, I did not wish to be in that steamer at that time and in those circumstances, and perhaps I was not even wanted there in the usual sense in which a ship wants an officer. It was the first and last instance in my sea life when I served ship owners who have remained completely shadowy to my apprehension. I do not mean this for the well-known firm of London shipbrokers which had chartered the ship to the I will not say short-lived, but ephemeral Franco-Canadian Transport Company. A death leaves something behind, but there was never anything tangible left from the FCTC. It flourished no longer than roses live, and unlike the roses, it blossomed in the dead of winter, admitted a sort of faint perfume of adventure, and died before spring set in. But indubitably it was a company. It had even a house flag, all white, with the letters FCTC artfully tangled up in a complicated monogram. We flew it at our main masthead, and now I have come to the conclusion that it was the only flag of its kind in existence. All the same, we on board, for many days, had the impression of being a unit of a large fleet with fortnightly departures for Montreal and Quebec, as advertised in pamphlets and prospectuses, which came aboard in a large package in Victoria Dock, London, just before we started for Rouen, France, and in the shadowy life of the FCTC lies the secret of that, my last employment in my calling, which in a remote sense interrupted the rhythmical development of Nina Almeyer's story.
The then secretary of the London Shipmasters Society, with its modest rooms in Fenchurch Street, was a man of indefatigable activity and the greatest devotion to his task. He is responsible for what was my last association with a ship. I call it that because it can hardly be called a seagoing experience. Dear Captain Froud, it is impossible not to pay him the tribute of affectionate familiarity at this distance of years, had very sound views as to the advancement of knowledge and status for the whole body of the officers of the mercantile marine. He organized for us courses of professional lectures. St. John ambulance classes corresponded industriously with public bodies and members of Parliament on subjects touching the interests of the service, and as to the oncoming of some inquiry or commission relating to matters of the sea and to the work of seamen it was a perfect godsend to his need of exerting himself on our corporate behalf together with this high sense of his official duties he had in him a vein of personal kindness a strong disposition to do what good he could to the individual members of that craft of which in his time he had been a very excellent master and what greater kindness can one do to a seaman than to put him in the way of employment. Captain Frode did not see why the Shipmaster Society, besides its general guardianship of our interests, should not be unofficially an employment agency of the very highest class. I am trying to persuade all our great ship-owning firms to come to us for their men. There is nothing of a trade union spirit about our society, and I really don't see why they should not he said once to me. I am always telling the captains, too, that all things being equal, they ought to give preference to the members of the society. In my position, I can generally find for them what they want amongst our members, or our associate members. In my wanderings about London, from west to east, and back again, I was very idle then, the two little rooms in Fenchurch Street, were a sort of resting place where my spirit, hankering after the sea, could feel itself nearer to the ships, the men, and the life of its choice, nearer there than on any other spot of the solid earth. This resting place used to be, at about five o'clock in the afternoon, full of men and tobacco smoke, but Captain Frode had the smaller room to himself, and there he granted private interviews, whose principal motive was to render service. Thus, one murky November afternoon, he beckoned me in with a crooked finger, and that peculiar glance above his spectacles, which is perhaps my strongest physical recollection of the man. "'I have had in here a shipmaster this morning,' he said, getting back to his desk and motioning me to a chair, who is in want of an officer. It's for a steamship. You know, nothing pleases me more than to be asked, but unfortunately I do not quite see my way.' As the outer room was full of men, I cast a wondering glance at the closed door, but he shook his head. Oh, yes, I should be only too glad to get that berth for one of them. But the fact of the matter is, the captain of that ship wants an officer who can speak French fluently, and that's not so easy to find. I do not know anybody myself but you. It's a second officer's berth, and, of course, you would not care, would you know? I know that it isn't what you are looking for. It was not. I had given myself up to the idleness of a haunted man who looks for nothing but words wherein to capture his visions. But I admit that outwardly I resembled sufficiently a man who could make a second officer for a steamer chartered by a French company. I showed no sign of being haunted by the fate of Nina and by the murmurs of tropical forests. And even my intimate intercourse with Almayer, a person of weak character, had not put a visible mark upon my features. For many years he and the world of his story had been the companions of my imagination, without, I hope, impairing my ability to deal with the realities of sea life. I had had the man and his surroundings with me ever since my return from the eastern waters, some four years before the day of which I speak. 
It was in the front sitting room of furnished apartments in a Pimlico square that they first began to live again with a vividness and poignancy quite foreign to our former real intercourse. I had been treating myself to a long stay on shore, and in the necessity of occupying my mornings, Almire, that old acquaintance, came nobly to the rescue. Before long, as was only proper, his wife and daughter joined him round my table, and then the rest of that pante band came full of words and gestures. Unknown to my respectable landlady, it was my practice directly after my breakfast to hold animated receptions of Malays, Arabs, and half-castes. They did not clamor aloud for my attention. They came with a silent and irresistible appeal. And the appeal, I affirm here, was not to my self-love or my vanity. It seems now to have had a moral character, for why should the memory of these beings, seen in their obscure sun-bathed existence, demand to express itself in the shape of a novel, except on the ground of that mysterious fellowship which unites in a community of hopes and fears all the dwellers on this earth? I did not receive my visitors with boisterous rapture as the bearers of any gifts or profit or fame. There was no vision of a printed book before me as I sat writing at that table, situated in a decayed part of Belgravia. After all these years, each leaving its evidence of slowly blackened pages, I can honestly say that it is a sentiment akin to piety which prompted me to render in words assembled with conscientious care the memory of things far distant and of men who had lived. But coming back to Captain Froud and his fixed idea of never disappointing ship owners or ship captains, it was not likely that I should fail him in his ambition to satisfy at a few hours' notice the unusual demand for a French-speaking officer. He explained to me that the ship was chartered by a French company intending to establish a regular monthly line of sailings from Rouen for the transport of French emigrants to Canada. But frankly, this sort of thing did not interest me very much. I said gravely that if it were really a matter of keeping up the reputation of the Shipmaster Society, I would consider it but the consideration was just for form's sake. The next day I interviewed the captain, and I believe we were impressed favorably with each other. He explained that his chief mate was an excellent man in every respect, and that he could not think of dismissing him so as to give me the higher position, but that if I consented to come as second officer I would be given certain special advantages, and so on. I told him that if I came at all the rank really did not matter. I am sure, he insisted, you will get on first rate with Mr. Paramore. I promised faithfully to stay for two trips at least, and it was in those circumstances that what was to be my last connection with a ship began. And after all, there was not even one single trip. It may be that it was simply the fulfillment of fate, of that written word on my forehead, which apparently forbade me, through all my sea wanderings, ever to achieve the crossing of the western ocean, using the worlds in that special sense in which sailors speak of western ocean trade, of western ocean packets, of western ocean hard cases. The new life attended closely upon the old, and the nine chapters of Almire's folly went with me to the Victoria Dock, whence in a few days we started for Rouen. I won't go so far as saying that the engaging of a man fated never to cross the Western Ocean was the absolute cause of the Franco-Canadian Transport Company's failure to achieve even a single passage. It might have been that, of course, but the obvious, gross obstacle was clearly the want of money. Four hundred and sixty bunks for emigrants were put together in the tween decks by industrious carpenters while we lay in the Victoria dock, but never an emigrant turned up in Rouen, of which, being a humane person, I confess I was glad. Some gentlemen from Paris, I think there were three of them, and one was said to be the chairman, turned up indeed, and went from end to end of the ship knocking their silk hats cruelly against the deck beams. I attended them personally, and I can vouch for it that the interest they took in things 
was intelligent enough, though, obviously, they had never seen anything of the sort before. Their faces, as they went ashore, wore a cheerfully inconclusive expression. Notwithstanding that this inspecting ceremony was supposed to be a preliminary to immediate sailing, it was then, as they filed down our gangway, that I received the inward monition that no sailing within the meaning of our charter party would ever take place. It must be said that in less than three weeks a move took place. When we first arrived, we had been taken up with much ceremony well towards the center of the town, and all the street corners being placarded with the tricolor posters announcing the birth of our company, the petit bourgeois with his wife and family made a Sunday holiday from the inspection of the ship. I was always in evidence in my best uniform, to give information, as though I had been a cook's tourist interpreter, while our quartermasters reaped a harvest of small change from personally conducted parties. But when the move was made, that move which carried us some mile and a half down the stream to be tied up to an altogether muddier and shabbier quay, then indeed the desolation of solitude became our lot. It was a complete and soundless stagnation, for as we had the ship ready for sea, to the smallest detail, as the frost was hard and the days short, we were absolutely idle, idle to the point of blushing with shame when the thought struck us that all the time our salaries went on. Young Cole was aggrieved because, as he said, he could not enjoy any sort of fun in the evening after loafing like this all day. Even the banjo lost its charm, since there was nothing to prevent his strumming on it all the time between the meals. The good paramour, he was really a most excellent fellow, became unhappy as far as was possible to his cheery nature, till one dreary day I suggested, out of sheer mischief, that he should employ the dormant energies of the crew in hauling both cables up on deck and turning them in for end. For a moment, Mr. Paramore was radiant. Excellent idea! But directly his face fell. Why, yes, but we can't make that job last more than three days, he muttered discontentedly. I don't know how long he expected us to be stuck on the riverside outskirts of Rouen, but I know that the cables got hauled up and turned end for end, according to my satanic suggestion, put down again, and the very existence utterly forgotten. I believe before a French river pilot came on board to take our ship down, empty as she came, into the Havre roads. You may think that the state of forced idleness favored some advance in the fortune of Almayer and his daughter. Yet it was not so. As if it were some sort of evil spell, my banjoist cabin-mate's interruption, as related above, had arrested them short at the point of that faithful sunset for many weeks together. It was always thus with this book, begun in 89 and finished in 94, with that shortest of all the novels which it was to be my lot to write. Between its opening exclamation calling Almayer to his dinner and his wife's voice, and Abdullah's, his enemy, mental reference to the God of Islam, the merciful, the compassionate, which closes the book, there were to come several long sea passages, a visit, to use the elevated phraseology suitable to the occasion, to the scenes, some of them, of my childhood, and the realization of childhood's vain words, expressing a light-hearted and romantic whim. It was in 1868, when, nine years old or thereabouts, that while looking at a map of Africa of the time, and putting my finger on the blank space, then representing the unsolved mystery of that continent, I said to myself with absolute assurance, and an amazing audacity, which are no longer in my character now, when I grow up, I shall go there. And, of course, I thought no more about it, till after a quarter of a century or so an opportunity offered to go there, as if the sin of childish audacity were to be visited on my mature head. Yes, I did go there, there being the region of Stanley Falls, 
which in sixty eight was the blankest of blank spaces on the earth's figured surface and the manuscript of almer's folly carried about me as if it were a talisman of a, or a treasure went there too that it ever came out of there seems a special dispensation of providence because a good many of my other properties infinitely more valuable and useful to me remain behind through unfortunate accidents of transportation i call to mind for instance a specially awkward turn of the congo between kinshasa and leopoldsville more particularly when one had to take it at night in a big canoe with only half the proper number of paddlers I failed in being the second white man on record drowned at that interesting spot through the upsetting of a canoe. The first was a young Belgian officer, but the accident happened some months before my time, and he, too, I believe, was going home, not perhaps quite so ill as myself, but still he was going home. I got round the turn more or less alive, though I was too sick to care whether I did or not, and always with Almayer's folly amongst my diminishing baggage, I arrived at that delectable capital, Boma, where before the departure of the steamer which was to take me home, I had the time to wish myself dead over and over again with perfect sincerity. At that day there were in existence only seven chapters of Almayer's folly, but the chapter in my history which followed was that of a long, long illness and very dismal convalescence. Geneva, or more precisely the hydropathic establishment of Champel, is rendered forever famous by the termination of the eighth chapter in the history of Almayer's decline and fall. The events of the ninth are inextricably mixed up with the details of the proper management of a waterside warehouse owned by a certain city firm whose name does not matter. But that work, undertaken to accustom myself again to the activities of a healthy existence, soon came to an end. The earth had nothing to hold me with for very long. And then that memorable story, like a cask of choice Madeira, got carried for three years to and fro upon the sea. Whether this treatment improved its flavor or not, of course I would not like to say, as far as appearance is concerned, it certainly did nothing of the kind. The whole manuscript acquired a faded look and an ancient yellowish complexion. It became at last unreasonable to suppose that anything in the world would ever happen to Almayer and Nina, and yet something most unlikely to happen on the high seas was to wake them up from their state of suspended animation. What is it that Novalis says? It is certain my conviction gains infinitely the moment another soul will believe in it. And what is a novel, if not a conviction, of our fellow man's existence, strong enough to take upon itself a form of imagined life clearer than reality, and whose accumulated verisimilitude of selected episodes puts to shame the pride of documentary history? Providence, which saved my manuscript from the Congo Rapids, brought it to the knowledge of a helpful soul far out on the open sea. It would be, on my part, the greatest ingratitude ever to forget the sallow, sunken face and the deep-set dark eyes of the young Cambridge man. He was a passenger for his health, on board the good ship Torrens, outward bound to Australia, who was the first reader of Almayer's Folly, the very first reader I ever had. Would it bore you very much reading a manuscript in a handwriting like mine? I asked him one evening, on a sudden impulse, at the end of a longish conversation, whose subject was Gibbon's history. Jacques, that was his name, was sitting in my cabin, one stormy dog watch below, after bringing me a book to read from his own traveling store. Not at all, he answered, with his courteous intonation and a faint smile. As I pulled a drawer open, his suddenly aroused curiosity gave him a watchful expression. I wonder what he expected to see. A poem, maybe. All that's beyond guessing now. He was not a cold, but a calm man, still more subdued by disease. A man of few words, and of an unassuming modesty in general intercourse, 
but with something uncommon in the whole of his person which set him apart from the undistinguished lot of our sixty passengers. His eyes had a thoughtful, introspective look. In his attractive, reserved manner, and in a veiled, sympathetic voice, he asked, "'What is this?' "'It is sort of a tale,' I answered, with an effort. "'It is not even finished yet. "'Nevertheless, I would like to know what you think of it.' He put the manuscript in the breast pocket of his jacket. I remember perfectly his thin, brown fingers folding it lengthwise. "'I will read it tomorrow,' he remarked, seizing the door-handle, and then, watching the roll of the ship for a propitious moment, he opened the door and was gone. In the moment of his exit I heard the sustained booming of the wind, the swish of the water on the decks of the torrents, and the subdued, as if distant, roar of the rising sea. I noted the growing disquiet in the great restlessness of the ocean, and responded professionally to it with the thought that at eight o'clock, in another half hour or so, at the furthest, the top gallant sails would have to come off the ship. Next day, but this time in the first dog watch, Jacques entered my cabin. He had a thick woolen muffler round his throat, and the manuscript was in his hand. He tendered it to me with a steady look but without a word. I took it in silence. He sat down on the couch, and still said nothing. I opened and shut a door under my desk, on which a filled-up log slate lay wide open in its wooden frame, waiting to be copied neatly into the sort of book I was accustomed to write with care, the ship's log-book. I turned my back squarely on the desk, and even then Jacques never offered a word. "'Well, what do you say?' I asked him at last. Is it worth finishing? This question expressed exactly the whole of my thoughts. Distinctly, he answered in his sedate, veiled voice, and then coughed a little. Were you interested? I inquired further, almost in a whisper. Very much. In a pause, I went on meeting instinctively the heavy rolling of the ship, and Jacques put his feet upon the couch. The curtain of my bed-place swung to and fro as it were a punkah. The bulkhead lamp circled in its gimbals, and now and then the cabin door rattled slightly in the gusts of wind. It was in latitude forty south, and nearly in the longitude of Greenwich, as far as I can remember, that these quiet rites of Almayer's and Nina's resurrection were taking place. In the prolonged silence it occurred to me that there were a good deal of retrospective writing in the story as far as it went. Was it intelligible in its action, I asked myself, as if already the storyteller were being born into the body of a seaman? But I heard on deck the whistle of the officer of the watch, and remained on the alert to catch the order that was to follow this call to attention. It reached me as a faint, fierce shout to square the yards. Aha! I thought to myself, a westerly blow coming on. Then I turned to my very first reader, who, alas, was not to live long enough to know the end of the tale. Now, let me ask you one more thing. Is the story quite clear to you as it stands? He raised his dark, gentle eyes to my face, and seemed surprised. Yes, perfectly. That was all I was to hear from his lips concerning the merits of Almayer's folly. We never spoke together of the book again. A long period of bad weather set in, and I had no thoughts left but for my duties, whilst poor Jock caught a fatal cold and had to keep close in his cabin. When we arrived in Adelaide, the first reader of my prose went at once up country, and died rather suddenly in the end, either in Australia, or it may be on the passage while going home through the Suez Canal. I am not sure which it was now, and I do not think I ever heard precisely though I made inquiries about him from some of our return passengers who, wandering about to see the country during the ship's stay in port, had come upon him here and there. At last we sailed, homeward bound, and still not one line was added to the careless scrawl of the many pages which poor Jacques 
had had the patience to read, with the very shadows of eternity gathering already in the hollows of his kind, steadfast eyes. The purpose instilled into me by his simple and final, distinctly, remained dormant, yet alive to await its opportunity. I dare say I am compelled, unconsciously compelled, now to write volume after volume, as in past years I was compelled to go to sea, voyage after voyage. Leaves must follow upon each other as leagues used to follow in the days gone by, on and on to the appointed end, which, being truth itself, is one, one for all men and for all occupations. I do not know which of the two impulses has appeared more mysterious and more wonderful to me. Still, in writing, as in going to sea, I had to wait my opportunity. Let me confess here that I was never one of those wonderful fellows that would go afloat in a wash-tub for the sake of the fun, and if I may pride myself upon my consistency, it was ever just the same with my writing. Some men, I have heard, write in railway carriages, and could do it, perhaps, sitting cross-legged on a clothesline, but I must confess that my sybaritic disposition will not consent to write without something at least resembling a chair. Line by line, rather than page by page, was the growth of Almayer's folly. And so it happened that I very nearly lost the manuscript, advanced now to the first words of the ninth chapter, in the Friedrichstrasse railway station, that's in Berlin, you know, on my way to Poland, or more precisely to Ukraine. On an early, sleepy morning, changing trains, in a hurry, I left my Gladstone bag in a refreshment room. A worthy and intelligent Koffertrager rescued it. Yet in my anxiety I was not thinking of the manuscript but of all the other things that were packed in the bag. In Warsaw, where I spent two days, those wandering pages were never exposed to the light, except once to candlelight, while the bag lay open on a chair. I was dressing hurriedly to dine at a sporting club. A friend of my childhood, he had been in the diplomatic service, but had turned to growing wheat on paternal acres, and we had not seen each other for over twenty years was sitting on the hotel sofa, waiting to carry me off there. "'You might tell me something of your life while you're dressing,' he suggested kindly. I do not think I told him much of my life story, either then or later. The talk of the select little party with which he made me dine was extremely animated and embraced most subjects under heaven, from big game shooting in Africa to the last poem published in a very modernist review, edited by the very young, and patronized by the highest society. But it never touched upon Almayer's folly. And next morning, in uninterrupted obscurity, this inseparable companion went on rolling with me in the southeast direction towards the government of Kiev. At that time there was an eight hours drive, if not more, from the railway station to the country house which was my destination. Dear boy, these words were always written in English. So ran the last letter from that house received in London. Get yourself driven to the only inn in the place, dine as well as you can, and some time in the evening, my own confidential servant, factotum, and major domo, a Mr. V. S. I warn you, he is of noble extraction, will present himself before you, reporting the arrival of the small sledge which will take you here on the next day. I send with him my heaviest fur, which I suppose, with such overcoats as you may have with you, will keep you from freezing on the road. Sure enough, as I was dining, served by a Hebrew waiter, in an enormous barn-like bedroom with a freshly painted floor, the door opened, and, in a travelling costume of long boots, big sheepskin cap, and a short coat girt with a leather belt, the Mr. V. S. of noble extraction, a man of about thirty-five, appeared with an air of perplexity on his open and mustachioed countenance. I got up from the table and greeted him in Polish, 
with, I hope, the right shade of consideration demanded by his noble blood and his confidential position. His face cleared up in a wonderful way. It appeared that, notwithstanding my uncle's earnest assurances, the good fellow had remained in doubt of our understanding each other. He imagined I would talk to him in some foreign language. I was told that his last words on getting into the sledge to come meet me shaped an anxious exclamation. "'Well, well, here I am going, but God only knows how I am to make myself understood to our master's nephew.' We understood each other very well from the first. He took charge of me, as I were not quite of age. I had a delightful boyish feeling of coming home from school when he muffled me up next morning in an enormous bearskin travelling coat and took his seat protectively by my side. The sledge was a very small one, and it looked utterly insignificant, almost like a toy behind the four big bays harnessed two and two. We three, counting the coachman, filled it completely. He was a young fellow with clear blue eyes. The high collar of his livery fur coat framed his cheerful countenance and stood all round level with the top of his head. Now, Joseph, my companion addressed him, do you think we shall manage to get home before six? His answer was that we would surely, with God's help, and providing there were no heavy drifts in the long stretch between certain villages whose names came with an extremely familiar sound to my ears. He turned out to be an excellent coachman with an instinct for keeping the road amongst the snow-covered fields and a natural gift of getting the best out of his horses. He is the son of that Joseph that I suppose the captain remembers, he who used to drive the captain's late grandmother of holy memory remarked v s busy tucking fur rugs about my feet i remembered perfectly the trusty joseph he used to drive my grandmother why he it was who let me hold the reins for the first time in my life and allowed me to play with a great four-in-hand whip outside the doors of the coach-house what became of him i asked he is no longer serving i suppose he served our master was the reply. But he died of cholera ten years ago now, that great epidemic we had. And his wife died at the same time, the whole houseful of them, and this is the only boy that was left. The manuscript of Almayer's Folly was reposing in the bag under our feet. I saw again the sun setting on the plains as I saw it in the travels of my childhood. It set clear and red, dipping into the snow in full view as if it were setting on the sea. It was twenty-three years since I had seen the sun set over that land, and we drove on in the darkness which fell swiftly upon the livid expanse of snows till, out of the waste of a white earth joining a bestarred sky, surged up black shapes, the clumps of trees about a village of the Ukrainian plain. A cottage or two glided by, a low, interminable wall, and then, glimmering and winking through a screen of fir-trees, the lights of the master's house. That very evening the wandering manuscript of Almayer's Folly was unpacked and unostentatiously laid on the writing-table in my room, the guest-room which had been, I was informed in an affectedly careless tone, awaiting me for some fifteen years or so. It attracted no attention from the affectionate presence hovering round the son of the favorite sister. "'You won't have many hours to yourself while you are staying with me, brother,' he said, this form of address borrowed from the speech of our peasants, being the usual expression of the highest good humor in a moment of affectionate elation. "'I shall be always coming in for a chat.' As a matter of fact, we had the whole house to chat in, and were everlastingly intruding upon each other. I invaded the retirement of his study, where the principal feature was a colossal silver inkstand presented to him on his fiftieth year by a subscription of all his wards then living. He had been guardian of many orphans of land-owning families from the three southern provinces, ever since the year 1860. Some of them had been my schoolfellows and playmates, but not one of them, girls or boys, that I know of, has ever written a novel. 
One or two were older than myself, considerably older, too. One of them, a visitor, I remember in my early years, was the man who first put me on horseback, and his four-horse bachelor turnout, his perfect horsemanship, and general skill in manly exercises was one of my earliest admirations. I seem to remember my mother looking on from a colonnade in front of the dining-room windows as I was lifted upon the pony, held for all I know by the very Joseph, the groom attached specially to my grandmother's service, who died of cholera. It was, certainly, a young man in a dark blue tailless coat and huge Cossack trousers, that being the livery of the men about the stables. It must have been in 1864, but reckoning, by another mode of calculating time, it was certainly in the year in which my mother obtained permission to travel south and visit her family, from the exile into which she had followed my father. For that, too, she had had to ask permission, and I know that one of the conditions of that favor was that she should be treated exactly as a condemned exile herself. Yet, a couple of years later, in memory of her eldest brother, who had served in the guards and, dying early, left hosts of friends, and a loved memory in the great world of St. Petersburg, some influential personages procured for her this permission. It was officially called the highest grace of a three months' leave from exile. This is also the year in which I first began to remember my mother with more distinctness than a mere loving, wide-browed, silent, protecting presence, whose eyes had a sort of commanding sweetness. And I also remember the great gathering of all the relations from near and far, and the gray heads of the family friends paying her the homage of respect and love in the house of her favorite brother, who, a few years later, was to take the place for me of both my parents. I did not understand the tragic significance of it all at the time, though indeed I remember that doctors also came. There were no signs of invalidism about her, but I think that already they had pronounced her doom, unless perhaps the change to a southern climate could re-establish her declining strength. For me it seems the very happiest period of my existence. There was my cousin, a delightful, quick-tempered little girl, some months younger than myself, whose life, lovingly watched over, as if she were a royal princess, came to an end with her fifteenth year. There were other children, too, many of whom are dead now, and not a few whose very names I have forgotten. Over all this hung the oppressive shadow of the great Russian Empire. The shadow lowering with the darkness of a newborn national hatred fostered by the Moscow School of Journalists against the Poles after the ill omen rising of 1863. This is a far cry back from the manuscript of Almayer's Folly, but the public record of these formative impressions is not the whim of an easy egotism. These two are things human, already distant in their appeal. It is meet that something more should be left for the novelist children than the colors and figures of his own hard-won creation that which in their grown-up years may appear to the world about them as the most enigmatic side of their natures and perhaps must remain forever obscure even to themselves will be their unconscious response to the still voice of that inexorable past from which his work of fiction and their personalities are remotely derived. Only in men's imagination does every truth find an effective and undeniable existence. Imagination, not invention, is the supreme master of art as of life. An imaginative and exact rendering of authentic memories may serve worthily that spirit of piety towards all things human which sanctions the conceptions of a writer of tales and the emotions of the man reviewing his own experience end of chapter one of some reminiscences by joseph conrad Four Classes That Constitute a Menace From Anti-Suffrage, Ten Good Reasons 
by Grace Duffield Goodwin. Reading by Bologna Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Four Classes That Constitute a Menace by Grace Duffield Goodwin. We are a nation of unsolved problems. Brains and time and patience are going into their solution. Our Negro and our alien problem are ours alone. No other nation shows a condition in which these two difficulties exist side by side and press for solution at the same time. At present, no one is bold enough to say that we are finding it easy to amalgamate the sorrowful legacy of our own greed and inhumanity in the race of struggling children just up from slavery. Confused and bewildered even yet by the sufferings of the past, the burden of the present, the blind ambitions of the future. Our American Negroes are not yet woven into the fabric of our common life. Their ignorance, their helplessness, has not yet ceased to be a political menace. In the southern states, where white control is held only by the frankest bribery, where the Negroes number five to one, or ten to one, as the case may be, it is proposed to add, for further exploitation and bribery, all the Negro women who are more helpless and ignorant than the men. This is said with full realization of the numbers of Negro men and women who are far beyond the average of their people. One has but to see the race close at hand, to recognize its sterling virtues and its dangerous weaknesses, virtues of sympathy, patience, cheerfulness, loyalty, weaknesses of moral fiber, and of mental grasp. We have the problem of the immigrant, coming here by millions in the last decade, coming from different political conditions, new to republicanism, new to responsibility, new to freedom, which, in the exuberance of the second generation, he misreads license. He clings to his own, and he makes in all our cities a ghetto, or a little Italy, or such a settlement as that of 50,000 Bohemians in New York, settlements which are not American in any particular. He populates the streets of the New England mill towns, until in Rhode Island one may walk perhaps two or three blocks without hearing a word of English. In five years he is a citizen. In five years he is expected, with the pressure of a terrible toil upon him, to learn the language, the customs, the ideals of his future home, and to become a unit in its government. As a matter of fact, the majority toil incessantly, learn very little, are exploited by the boss of the ward, know little and care less about the government of their adopted country. What we are doing to make him worthy of citizenship is but a drop in the bucket compared to his numbers and his need. We must put time and brains upon the problem of the foreign man as a voter. How will it help to add the foreign woman? All workers among these people recognize how much more backward is the foreign woman than the foreign man. Many of the women live years in this country without even learning the language. This is not true of the younger generation, which tends to irreligion and lawlessness. The reaction does not set in until the third generation, as those well know who have lived and worked among them. The older and the younger foreign women, for very different reasons, would add greatly to the danger of the naturalized foreign vote. And as we are constantly receiving them, and as the quality is steadily deteriorating, we shall have this to consider for many years to come. The suffragist proposes to double these two problems. 
We have in common with all countries the problem of the vicious woman, numbered in our cities by the thousands. The suffragists tell us that they will not vote, that they will not register because they do not desire publicity. They are already registered in the list kept by the police in many cities. They are not classed as criminal, only as potentially so. They would not shrink from registration, and the men who exploit them would see that they voted. To a woman in this class, I said, not long ago, Do you want to vote? Yes, she replied. Why? I asked. What would you do with the ballot? God, she breathed, raising tragic arms above her head. I'd sell it and take a vacation. Another problem in all countries is that of the intelligent, conscienceless woman. She exists, and she is the companion of the intelligent, conscienceless man who plays politics for what there is in it, here in America, as perhaps nowhere else in the world to the same extent. The man who makes the public shame of Philadelphia, or Pittsburgh, or Denver, or San Francisco, or Adams County, Ohio. The shame of every American city and town that owns the rule of the boss and the ring, that has political axes to grind and political trades to make. Over against these four classes of undesirable voters among women would be the comparatively small number of earnest, intelligent women capable of handling public affairs. They would be overwhelmed by numbers. End of Four Classes That Constitute a Menace by Grace Duffield Goodwin A Quartet of Potters from All Manner of Folk, Interpretations and Studies by Holbrook Jackson Reading by Bologna Times This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. A Quartet of Potters by Holbrook Jackson Before me, as I write, stands a vase. There is nothing remarkable in that, but this is a vase of distinctive yet unobtrusive grace. It is not necessarily the grace that holds you in thrall at the first glance, although it has that power also, but the grace that insinuates and wins you unawares. Its proportion is so exquisite that it affects the mind like music, like slow, stately music, or better, like the balance of the large, easy flight of certain seabirds. It compels you to think of such things, of balanced, accomplished things, things which round off, as it were, the infinitude in which every man's thoughts flounder and fret or take their ease. Yet you are not only delighted by the proportion of my face, for this proportion is wedded unto a subtle coloring of equal charm. There is something strident, something of the brass band, in the coloring of so much pottery, even in Imari and Satsuma, in Severis and Derby and in Delft. But no hints of high sounds spring out of the greens and grays which bewitch the eye on the shell-like surface of my face. All is modulated to a harmony of whispering quiet. To look at my vase, after the hurly-burly of the modern day, is like going into a retreat where the telephone bell is not and the motor never was. You feel grateful to those greens fading into greys, and greys fading into green, in and out of which curve and float the quaintest and most graceful of fishes etched richly into the clay. A little to the westward of Chancery Lane, on the opposite side of Holborn, there is one of those dim lanes of tall and somewhat unkempt houses, with shop fronts which are, if not particular to, at least at their best in London. 
About halfway down the lane, which is called Brownlow Street, there is a little shop, in whose white-framed window may be seen at any time of the year an assortment of stoneware vases akin to mine, and there are as well jugs and other objects of the potter's craft, pieces of craftsmanship which every now and then hold up the judicious passer-by in wonderment. There is nothing about the little shop at all like the shops of modern commerce. Business, you imagine, may possibly take place there, but you feel that the main object is something different. The pots are not arranged like the crockery in an ordinary shop, and there is slight evidence of antagonism towards the dust. When you enter the shop, the effect is much the same. You find yourself in a dim-lit passage with crowded shelves of stoneware jugs carved into leering, laughing, grinning, and ogling faces, jostling the most impossible, and withal most fascinating, pot-birds with delightfully disturbing anthropological expressions. Faces as beautiful as the one I have described, and of innumerable shapes and sizes and queer little imps blowing horns or beating cymbals, a curious but goodly assembly of unique ceramic products, huddled together in their dim and dusty domain, with every appearance of self-satisfaction and content. Opposite the shelves is a desk with an ink-pot of the same ware as the other pottery, and a little chaos of papers, and this last is the only suggestion of commerce. You are undecided how far to proceed, for you see more light and more strange and beautiful pots in a small square room beyond. But presently you are set at rest by the appearance of a little man, bespectacled and neglect, with a half-carved figure of clay in one hand and a wooden tool like a scalpel in the other. You notice, although the light is dim, that his face swathed though it is in a shaggy beard, and crowned with a tangled mane of brown and gray hair, is quick with the intelligence of the artist. And, if you are patient, you will soon realize that you stand before a master craftsman, Wallace Martin, the eldest of the quartet of brothers who make the stoneware, which has given me so much delight. Or it may be that you will be received by Edwin Martin, a taller man of middle age, with the sensitive face of a poet. He also comes with his work in his hand, in all probability an unfired vase, into whose drab clay he is etching some quaint device, for that is his contribution to the art of creating martinware. These potters do not approach you as shopmen, and I dare not think what would happen if you attempted immediately to open up commercial relations. I have seen many pieces of stoneware bought of Wallace and Edwin Martin, but I have never seen them sell a piece. The pots are there, they have their prices marked on them, you may examine them and admire, and, if you wish, purchase them, but if you only admire you are just as, and, I sometimes think, more welcome, for the Martin brothers are reluctant to part with the treasures they have made. They are jealous of other ownership even after they are convinced of its worthiness. There is a charming simplicity about these brothers. Their craft is everything, and they never tire of discussing it in quiet, homely phrases which tell you far more than all the art talk of the drawing-rooms and the coteries. All about you are pots of superb proportion and exquisite coloring, and there is also enough quaintness and whimsical fancy in clay in their shop to make the fortune of any black-and-white artist. Yet there is no talk about art as such, only about the actual making of these things, by men who have a childlike joy and pride in their work, and who love their work, and are happy in telling you about it. William Morris would have delighted in these men, whose creations are the quintessence of joy and work combined and he would have loved to hear Wallace Martin, clay in hand, discussing enthusiastically problems of life and religion, 
commingled with a deeply informed technical interpretation of his craft. This enthusiasm and practical knowledge is manifested even in the simplest piece of Martinware. You have but to look at these creations to recognize that their makers live for them. It is this reverent and joyful craftsmanship infused with rare imagination which turns the rough clay into beautiful faces and jugs, strange birds and imps, and satyrs that have become devils in the medieval vision of Wallace Martin. Martin brothers are all the more remarkable in our age because they are pure Londoners, and indeed there is not a little of the color of London in the low tones of their dyes. Their father was Robert Thomas Martin, stationer of Queen Hythe, Thames Strait, e.g., coming originally from Norfolk, but their mother was actually a native of Thames Street in the city, and in that street Wallace also was born. They first began as potters at Fulham in 1873, and in 1877 moved to Southall, where their pottery has remained till now. Rarely have four brothers so complimented one another, and for forty years their complementary qualities worked eloquently together, when death took Charles Martin away from them. A remarkable circumstance of this fraternal partnership is the fact that each brother has carried out a certain and definite part of the work, and a kind of division of labor has existed throughout, which, in other circumstances, might have had ill effects on the completed objects of their craft, but the sympathy of the brothers in their cooperate aim has saved their work from the evils of that bane of all good craftsmanship, the division of labor. Wallace Martin, who is nearing the age of seventy, is the sculptor and modeler. Quaint face jugs, musical imps, and delightful grotesque birds are the outcome of his genius and handiwork. Walter Martin combines the art of potter and chemist. It is he who mixes the West of England clays of which the pots are made, and stands all day at the ancient potter's wheel, throwing the beautiful shapes which are later etched all over with the strangely fascinating devices of Edwin Martin, who is the etcher and painter of the combination. Walter is responsible also for the pigments used in the coloring of the clays. The late Charles Martin, who died in June 1909, in his 62nd year, used to preside over the little shop in Brownlow Street, watching affectionately over the beloved pots and releasing them reluctantly. All the work of firing, mixing clays and chemicals, throwing, modeling, etching, and selling is done by the brothers Martin without any outside help, and every piece they make is unique, no shape or design ever being repeated. With medieval simplicity and sincerity, the Martin brothers go to work, requiring few aids from modern science, and although they seem to be far apart from the scramble and shouting of the modern world, throwing back, as it were, to the remote Middle Ages, yet are they modern in a very real way. The modern note is struck in each of their creations. They are out of touch, however, with all save a few in this age in their rule of never repeating a single design. The uniformity of today has not reached the Martin pottery which means that these craftsmen are not manufacturers, and their pottery remote from the pot-banks of Staffordshire. All the prodigality of genius is to be found in the infinite variety of their products. But, at the same time, there is no striving after vain effects. Each piece of martinware is unique, but all martinware is alike, just as you will find variation and personality expressed in the details of the harmony which goes to the building of a gothic minster. The two chief variations of martinware are color and decoration. The colors are generally worked into the actual clay before firing, and sometimes inlaid by the decorator. 
The bulk of the designs, especially those of Edwin Morton, are etched in clay. Charm of color and design is always a characteristic of Martin ware, but besides these qualities an incalculable charm is derived from the hard, shell-like surface of all the pieces. The surface is a triumph of the ceramic art. It is really a salt glaze produced by submitting each piece to the ordeal of actual contact with salt-fed flames. In the early days of the pottery, experiments were made in design, and it was some years before the potters found the real trend of their genius. At first they borrowed motifs from the Renaissance, but today these early efforts, though excellent in form, look crude in design beside their later work. Today they follow no school, but find a real basis of design in their own whims and fancies. Inlaid and indented devices, following the geometrical designs of the artificer nature, as she reveals herself in gourd and seashell, now dominate the vase shapes, varied by strange and beautifully etched devices of fishes, crustaceans, weird lizards, and dragons. The Martin brothers' love of the grotesque is best exemplified in the modeled figures and birds of Wallace Martin. In these there is a mastery beyond praise. Quietly, for years, and almost unknown, seeking no fame, and content with an income that would be despised by a suburban grocer, Wallace Martin has gone on carving his balls of clay into fancies that will live. He has passed the age when praise might have spoiled him. Indeed, praise of his genius is unnecessary, for, if I understand him aright, he wants neither that, nor fame, nor great wealth. If you enjoy the things he joys in making, it will be enough. But when we deplore the absence of originality among our native sculptors, we may find hope in remembering Wallace Martin. His grotesque face jugs are joys forever worthy receptacles of generous beverages. His imps and satyrs conquer by the very abandon of their impishness. Whilst his birds defy all words, they are inexplicable and irresistible. They are a new species. An Addition to Nature Half-humans they are, and wise and sad and knowing, and you find yourself talking to them as though they lived. Perhaps they do somewhere, or, if not, I am sure they will, some day. Wallace Martin, it may be, is teaching nature some new tricks. Elsewhere we have nothing to compare with them save such literary cattle as the Jabberwock, the Quangle Wangle Quee, and the Snark. Still, Lewis Carroll and Edward Lear did think along the same lines as Wallace Martin. They dreamed similar dreams. Only Wallace Martin has dreamt them in clay and baptized them with flame. End of A Quartet of Potters by Holbrook Jackson Peace and War in the Balkans by Norman Angel From Peace Theories and the Balkan War Reading by Bologna Times this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Peace and War in the Balkans by Norman Angel Peace in the Balkans under the Turkish system The inadequacy of our terms The repulsion of the Turkish invasion The Christian effort to bring the reign of force and conquest to an end the difference between action designed to settle relationship on force and counteraction designed to prevent such settlement, the force of the policeman and the force of the brigand, the failure of conquest as exemplified by the Turk. Will the Balkan peoples prove pacifist or bellicist, adopt the Turkish or the Christian system? Had we thrashed out the question of war and peace as we must finally, it would be hardly necessary to explain that the apparent paradox in answer number four, that war is futile 
and that this war will have immense benefits, is due to the inadequacy of our language, which compels us to use the same word for two opposed purposes, not to any real contradiction of fact. We call the condition of the Balkan Peninsula peace until the other day, merely because the respective ambassadors still happened to be resident in the capitals to which they were accredited. Let us see what peace, under Turkish rule, really meant, and who is the real invader in this war. Here is a very friendly and impartial witness, Sir Charles Eliot, who paints for us the character of the Turk as an quote, administrator. Unquote. Quote, the Turk in Europe has an overweening sense of his superiority and remains a nation apart, mixing little with the conquered populations, whose customs and ideas he tolerates, but makes little effort to understand. The expression, indeed, quote, Turkey in Europe, unquote, means, indeed, no more than, quote, England in Asia, unquote, if used as a designation for India. The Turks have done little to assimilate the people whom they have conquered, and still less been assimilated by them. In the larger part of the Turkish dominions, the Turks themselves are in a minority, the Turks certainly resent the dismemberment of their empire, but not in the sense in which the French resent the conquest of Alsace-Lorraine by Germany. They would never use the word Turkey, or even its oriental equivalent, the high country, in ordinary conversation. They would never say that Syria and Greece are parts of Turkey, which have been detached, but merely that they are tributaries, which have become independent provinces once occupied by Turks, where there are no Turks now. As soon as a province passes under another government, the Turks find it as the most natural thing in the world to leave it and go somewhere else. In the same spirit, the Turk talks quite pleasantly of leaving Constantinople some day. He will go over to Asia and found another capital. One can hardly imagine Englishmen speaking like that of London but they might conceivably speak so of Calcutta. The Turk is a conqueror, and nothing else. The history of the Turk is a catalogue of battles. His contributions to art, literature, science, and religion are practically nil. Their desire has not been to instruct, to improve, hardly even to govern, but simply to conquer. The Turk makes nothing at all. He takes whatever he can get, as plunder or pillage, he lives in the houses which he finds, or which he orders to be built for him. In unfavorable circumstances, he is a marauder. In favorable, a grand seigneur, who thinks it is his right to enjoy with grace and dignity all that the world can hold, but who will not lower himself by engaging in art, literature, trade, or manufacture. Why should he, when there are other people to do these things for him, Indeed, it may be said that he takes from others even his religion, clothes, language, customs. There is hardly anything which is Turkish and not borrowed. The religion is Arabic, the language half Arabic and Persian, the literature almost entirely imitative, the art Persian or Byzantine, the costumes in the upper classes an army, mostly European. There is nothing characteristic in manufacture or commerce, except an aversion to such pursuits. In fact, all occupations, except agriculture and military service, are distasteful to the true Osmanli. He is not much of a merchant. He may keep a stall in a bazaar, but his operations are rarely undertaken on a scale which merits the name of commerce or finance. It is strange to observe how, when trade becomes active in any seaport, or upon the railway lines, the Osmanli retires and disappears, while Greeks, Armenians, and Levantines thrive in his place. Neither does he much affect law, medicine, or the learned professions. Such callings are followed by Muslims, but they are apt to be of non-Turkish race. But though he does none of these things, the Turk is a soldier. The moment a sword or rifle is put into his hands, he instinctively knows how to use it with effect, and feels at home in the ranks or on a horse. 
the turkish army is not so much a profession or an institution necessitated by the fears and aims of the government as the quite normal state of the turkish nation every turk is a born soldier and adopts other pursuits chiefly because times are bad when there is a question of fighting if only in a riot the stolid peasant wakes up and shows surprising power of finding organization and expedience and alas a surprising ferocity the ordinary turk is an honest and good-humoured soul kind to children and animals and very patient but when the fighting spirit comes on him he becomes like the terrible warriors of the huns or genghis khan and slays burns and ravages without mercy or discrimination unquote. such is the verdict of an instructed travelled and observant english author and diplomatist who lived among these people for many years and who learned to like them who studied them and their history it does not differ of course appreciably from what practically every student of the turk has discovered the turk is the typical conqueror as a nation he has lived by the sword and he is dying by the sword because the sword the mere exercise of force by one man or group of men upon another conquest in other words is an impossible form of human relationship and in order to maintain this evil form of relationship its evil and futility is the whole basis of the principles i have attempted to illustrate he has not even observed the rough chivalry of the brigand the brigand though he might knock men on the head will refrain from having his force take the form of butchering women and disemboweling children not so the turk his attempt at government will take the form of the obscene torture of children of a bestial ferocity which is not a matter of dispute or exaggeration but a thing to which scores hundreds thousands even of credible european witnesses have testified the finest gentleman sir that ever butchered a woman or burned a village is the phrase that punch most justly puts into the mouth of the defender of our traditional turcophile policy and this condition is peace and the act which would put a stop to it is war it is the inexactitude and inadequacy of our language which creates much of the confusion of thought in this matter we have the same term for action destined to achieve a given end for a counteraction destined to prevent it yet we manage in other than the international field in civil matters to make the thing clear enough once an american town was set light to by incendiaries and was threatened with destruction in order to save at least a part of it the authorities deliberately burned down a block of buildings in the pathway of the fire would those incendiaries be entitled to say that the town authorities were incendiaries also and quote, believed in setting light to towns unquote? yet this is precisely the view of those who tax pacifists with approving war because they approve the measure aimed at bringing it to an end put it another way you do not believe that force should determine the transfer of property or conformity to a creed and i say to you quote, hand me your purse and conform to my creed or i'll kill you unquote. you say quote, because i do not believe that force should settle these matters i shall try and prevent it settling them and therefore if you attack i shall resist if i did not i should be allowing force to settle them unquote. I attack, you resist and disarm me, and say, quote, My force having neutralized yours, and the equilibrium being now established, I will hear any reasons you may have to urge for me for my paying you money, or any argument in favor of your creed. Reason, understanding, adjustment shall settle it. Unquote. You would be a pacifist or if you deem that that word connotes non-resistance though to the immense bulk of pacifists it does not you would be an anti-bellicist to use a dreadful word coined by monsieur emile fagui in the discussion of this matter if 
however, you said, quote, having disarmed you and established the equilibrium, I shall now upset it in my favor by taking your weapon and using it against you unless you hand me your purse and subscribe to my creed. I do this because force alone can determine issues, and because it is a law of life that the strong should eat up the weak, unquote. You would then be a bellicist. In the same way, when we prevent the brigand from carrying on his trade, taking wealth by force, it is not because we believe in force as a means of livelihood, but precisely because we do not. And if, in preventing the brigand from knocking out brains, we are compelled to knock out his brains, it is because we believe in knocking out people's brains? Or would we urge that to do so is the way to carry on a trade, or a nation, or a government, or make it the basis of human relationship. In every civilized country, the basis of the relationship on which the community rests is this. No individual is allowed to settle his differences with another by force. But does this mean that if one threatens to take my purse, I am not allowed to use force to prevent it? That if he threatens to kill me, I am not to defend myself because, quote, the individual citizens are not allowed to settle their differences by force. Unquote. It is because of that, because the act of self-defense is an attempt to prevent the settlement of a difference by force, that the law justifies it. But the law would not justify me if, having disarmed my opponent, having neutralized his force by my own, and reestablished the social equilibrium, I immediately proceeded to upset it, by asking him for his purse on pain of murder. I should then be settling the matter by force. I should then have ceased to be a pacifist, and have become a bellicist. For that is the difference between the two conceptions. The bellicist says, quote, Force alone can settle these matters. It is the final appeal. Therefore, fight it out. Let the best man win. When you have preponderant strength, impose your view. Force the other man to your will not because it is right, but because you are able to do so." Unquote. It is the excellent policy which Lord Roberts attributes to Germany and approves. We anti take an exactly contrary view. We say, quote, To fight it out settles nothing, since it is not a question of who is stronger, but of whose view is best. And as that is not always easy to establish, it is of the utmost importance in the interests of all parties, in the long run, to keep force out of it. The former is the policy of the Turks. They have been obsessed with the idea that if only they had enough of physical force ruthlessly exercised, they could solve the whole question of government, of existence for that matter, without troubling about social adjustment, understanding, equity, law, commerce, blood and iron were all that was needed. The success of that policy can now be judged. And whether good or evil comes of the present war will depend upon whether the Balkan states are on the whole guided by the Bellicist principle or the opposed one. If, having now momentarily eliminated force as between themselves, then reintroduce it, if the strongest presumably Bulgaria, adopts Lord Robert's excellent policy of striking because she has the preponderant force, enters upon a career of conquest of other members of the Balkan League, and the populations of the conquered territories, using them for exploitation by military force, why then there will be no settlement, and this war will have accomplished nothing save futile waste and slaughter. For they will have taken under a new flag the pathway of the Turk to savagery, degeneration, death. But if, on the other hand, they are guided more by the pacifist principle, if they believe that cooperation between states is better than conflict between them, if they believe that the common interest of all in good government is greater than the special interest of any one in conquest, that the understanding of human relationships the capacity for organization of society are the means by which men progress, and not the imposition of force by one man or group upon another, why, they will have taken the pathway to better civilization. But then, 
they will have disregarded Lord Roberts' advice. And this distinction between the two systems, far from being a matter of abstract theory or of metaphysics or logic chopping, is just the difference which distinguishes the Briton from the Turk, which distinguishes Britain from Turkey. The Turk has just as much physical vigor as the Briton, is just as virile, manly, and military. The Turk has the same raw materials of nature, soil, and water. There is no difference in the capacity for the exercise of physical force, or, if there is, the difference is in favor of the Turk. The real difference is a difference of ideas, of mind, and outlook on the part of the individuals composing the respective societies. The Turk has one general conception of human society, and the code and principles upon which it is founded, mainly a militarist one, and the Englishman has another, mainly a pacifist one. And whether the European society as a whole is to drift towards the Turkish ideal or towards the English ideal would depend upon whether it is animated mainly by the pacifist or mainly by the bellicist doctrine. If the former, it will stagger blindly, like the Turk along the path to barbarism. If the latter, it will take a better road. End of Peace and War in the Balkans by Norman Angel How to Mix the Mother Tongue by Anonymous from The Siren, University of Illinois at Urbana, Monthly Magazine Read by Bologna Times this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. How to Mix the Mother Tongue A Few Phrases and How to Use Them We aim to please our readers. For this purpose, we have secured A. Warm Babe, a former East Sider, to interpret and illustrate a few of the latest fashions in slang. These will appear each month. I Should Worry a very new and novel effect in saying one thing and meaning the other. This phrase should be delivered in a guttural yet jovial tone, and accompanied by an absolutely carefree and, if possible, inane expression of countenance. It means, literally, sweet essence of joy, the world's sky blue. Nix on that stuff! From Nix small incisions and stuffing, the Christmas intestines of a turkey, a late and pleasing perversion. It should be said in a nasal tone and emitted from the corner of the mouth. An effective accompaniment is a curt flip of one's hand on a level with the hip. Practice this before the mirror. Translation? Cheese it, kid. I'm curdling. String me, dear. I'm beans from string get me going and beans off my lid use this as a proposal speech its best setting is a dark and lonely porch furnished with one small settee said in a low voice ringing with tenderness and pathos this sentence is tremendously effective practice in the basement or better still try it on your sister editor's note we hope our readers will take advantage of this column each month to improve their grasp of the English idiom. How to Mix the Mother Tongue More Meaningless Expressions of Importance I give a damn. Although not very naughty, still not very nice. Said with a shrug of the shoulders and a snap of the fingers, this sentence is a delightfully asinine substitute for its opposite. Blasé diffidence is regarded by some as the best policy. Kindly arouse the anti-cow. From to cow, to subdue, and auntie, a donor of unforgettable scarves. A delicate and charming method of saying, shoot the oleo. Accompany the speech with a sugary and confiding smile to assure your hostess that you simply adore the white extract of suet. Practice first on a spoonful of lard. Mingle, kid. I'm tired of life. Or, 
the midnight ride of Paul Revere. An absolutely irresistible invitation when used by a member of the feminine sex. This phrase originated in the soft depths of a taxicab, but although the setting cannot be bettered, a darkened room is a worthy substitute. The speaker should open her arms appealingly, but a pathetic droop in her voice and a sobbing catch in her throat. Opportunity offers observe the cooing of the rain dove and rain. All's fair in war. Practice on your brother in law. The exact meaning of the command is Whoop skirts, how I love those eyes. Editor's note This is the second installment of A Gumdrops Compendium of English Idioms. Watch and improve. How to Mix the Mother Tongue A Symposium of Scintillating Sentences Play with me, hon. I'm kittenish. From the Persian Cat and the Grecian Play To be used only by a member of the weaker sex. The weaker, the weaker. The perpetrator should smile coyly and take two light and airy dance steps. The heavier she is, the more entertaining the phrase. Practice in low-heeled shoes. Try first on a barber's pole. If it responds, the student may safely venture the phrase in public. O oh, love, thou art a blushing rose. Derivation unknown. This is a most effective sentence when purred by a gentleman to the accompaniment of a lustrous moon and the soft breezing of a lovelorn lass. Wait for a silence and break it with the above while gazing raptly at the moon. This is extremely potent. Practice this on a punching bag. We do not guarantee immunity from personal injury. Punch me. I'm a member of the bovine union. From punch, something humorous that the conductor does, and union, a species of garment. This is an invitation to physical combat. The occasion for its use may be safely left to the discretion of the student. If he be large, he can use it frequently. If small, he should use it only on members of the feminine sex, and then after deliberation. Try this on your roommate. He's kind and may not hurt you. The exact translation is, Have some hair? I've got lots. Editor's Note There are tricks in every trade. Learn to use your tongue by studying Be Happy's Symposium. Watch and improve. How to Mix the Mother Tongue A Few Christmas Compounds by C. A. Pawnbroker Sweet Ringing Chimes, Where is My Purse? From Ringer, An Instrument for Ringing Most Anything from Anything and Peric, An Epithet Sometimes Applied to Human Beings This expression may be used most any time after December 24. Its use is not limited by sex, age, politics, social position, matrimonial condition, nor the high cost of living. It is an utterance of deep despair and black despondency. Don't spoil a tragic moment by smiling. Meaning, Christmas lasts for half a year. Accept these presents, O Imogene of loveliness. From presents a legitimate something for next to nothing, and image, something that looks like you, but isn't. The latest manner of expressing one's highest regards at this beautiful Christmas season. This bit of sentiment is never regarded as mawkish, and is very pleasing when delivered with proper accompaniment. If you lisp, hang a sprig of holly on your lower lip. The translation of this speech is approximately, Stick, kid, I'm syrupy. Oh, John, it's the nicest of all. Derivation unknown. John, in this sentence, is interchangeable with Bill, Jim, Reginald, or any other good spender. Used to best advantage by a member of the feminine sex. The pupil should clasp her hands over her breast and jump up and down in childish glee. If a cripple, or a perfect sixty-seven, the jumping may be omitted. Gratitude is the soul of Christmas. Great care should be taken not to insert the wrong name. These columns are not foolproof. 
practice this expression on a chewing gum machine. If you make it give twice, you are an accomplished pupil. Editor's Notice Merry Christmas, readers. We hope these swat knees will bring joy to many hearts. Watch and improve. End of How to Mix the Mother Tongue by Anonymous A Woman's Wrath by Isaac Love Perez Translated by Helena Frank From Yiddish Tales Reading by Bologna Times This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. A Woman's Wrath by Isaac Love Perez The small room is dingy as the poverty that clings to its walls. There is a hook fastened to the crumbling ceiling, relic of a departed hanging lamp. The old healing stove is girded about with a coarse sack, and leans sideways towards its gloomy neighbor, the black, empty fireplace, in which stands an inverted cooking pot with a chipped rim. Besides it lies a broken spoon, which met its fate in unequal contest with the scraping of cold, stale porridge. The room is choked with furniture. There is a four-post bed with torn curtains. The pillows, visible through their holes, have no covers. There is a cradle with the large yellow head of a sleeping child, a chest with metal fittings, and an open padlock, nothing very precious left in there, evidently. Further, a table and three chairs, originally painted red, a cupboard, now somewhat damaged. Add to these a pail of clean water and one of dirty water, an oven rake with a shovel, and you will understand that a pen could hardly drop onto the floor. And yet the room contains him and her beside. She, a middle-aged Jewess, sits on the chest that fills the space between the bed and the cradle. To her right is the one grimy little window. To her left, the table. She is knitting a sock, rocking the cradle with her foot, and listens to him reading the Talmud at the table with a tearful, Wallachian singing intonation, and swaying to and fro with a series of nervous jerks. Some of the words he swallows, others he draws out. Now he snaps at a word, and now he skips it. Some he accentuates and dwells on lovingly, others he rattles out with indifference, like dried peas out of a bag, and never quiet for a moment. First, he draws from his pocket a once red and whole handkerchief, and wipes his nose and brow. Then he lets it fall into his lap, and begins twisting his earlocks, or pulling at his thin, pointed, faintly grizzled beard. Again he lays a pulled-out hair from the same between the leaves of his book, and slaps his knees. His fingers coming into contact with the handkerchief, they seize it, and throw a corner in between his teeth. He bites it, lays one foot across the other, and continually shuffles with both feet. All the while his pale forehead wrinkles, now in a perpendicular, now in a horizontal direction, when the long eyebrows are nearly lost below the folds of skin. At times, apparently, he has a sting in the chest, for he beats his left side as though he were saying the alchets. Suddenly he leans his head to the left, presses a finger against his left nostril, and emits an artificial sneeze, leans his head to the right, and the proceeding is repeated. In between he takes a pinch of snuff, pulls himself together, his voice rings louder, the chair creaks, the table wobbles. The child does not wake. The sounds are too familiar to disturb it. And she, the wife, shriveled and shrunk before her time, sits and drinks in delight. She never takes her eye off her husband. Her ear lets no inflection of his voice escape. Now and then, it is true, she sighs, were he as fit for this world as he is for the other world, she would have a good time of it here. Two, here, two. Mah! She consoles herself. Who talks of honor? 
Not everyone is worthy of both tables. She listens. Her shriveled face alters from minute to minute. She is nervous, too. A moment ago it was eloquent of delight. Now she remembers it is Thursday. There isn't a dryer to spend in preparation for Sabbath. The light in her face goes out by degrees. The smile fades. Then she takes a look through the grimy window, glances at the sun. It must be getting late, and there isn't a spoonful of hot water in the house. The needles pause in her hand. A shadow has overspread her face. She looks at the child. It is sleeping less quietly, and will soon wake. The child is poorly, and there is not a drop of milk for it. The shadow on her face deepens into gloom. The needles tremble and move convulsively. And when she remembers that it is near Passover, that her earrings and the festal candlesticks are at the pawn shop, the chest empty, the lamp sold, then the needles perform murderous antics in her fingers. The gloom on her brow is that of a gathering thunderstorm. Lightnings play in her small, gray, sunken eyes. He sits and learns, unconscious of the charged atmosphere, does not see her let the sock fall and begin wringing her finger joints, does not see that her forehead is puckered with misery, one eye closed, and the other fixed on him, her learned husband, with a look fit to send a chill through his every limb, does not see her dry lips tremble and her jaw quiver. She controls herself with all her might, but the storm is gathering fury within her. The least thing, and it will explode. That least thing has happened. He was just translating a Talmudic phrase with quick delight. And thence we derive that he was going on with three. But the word derive was enough. It was the lighted spark, and her heart was the gunpowder. It was ablaze in an instant. Her determination gave way. The unlucky word opened the floodgates, and the waters poured through, carrying all before them. Derived, you say? Derived? Oh, derived may you be, lord of the world, she exclaimed, hoarse with anger. Derived you may be, yes, you, she hissed like a snake. Passover coming Thursday, and the child ill, and not a drop of milk is there. Ha! Huh? Her breath gives out. Her sunken breast heaves, her eyes flash. He sits like one turned to stone. Then, pale and breathless, too, from fright, he gets up and edges toward the door. At the door he turns and faces her, and sees that hand and tongue are equally helpless from passion. His eyes grow smaller, he catches a bit of handkerchief between his teeth, retreats a little further, takes a deeper breath, and mutters, Listen, woman. Do you know what Bittal Torah means? And not letting a husband study in peace? To be always worrying about livelihood, huh? And who feeds the little birds? Tell me. Always this want of faith in God, this giving way to temptation, and taking thought for this world. Foolish, ill-natured woman. Not to let a husband study. If you don't take care, you will go to Gehenna. Receiving no answer, he grows bolder. Her face gets paler and paler. She trembles more and more violently. And the paler she becomes, and the more she trembles, the steadier his voice as he goes on. Gehenna, fire, hanging by the tongue, four death penalties inflicted by the court. She is silent. Her face is white as chalk. He feels that he is doing wrong, that he has no call to be cruel that he is taking a mean advantage. But he has risen, as it were, to the top, and is boiling over. He cannot help himself. Do you know, he threatens her, what Skylo means? It means stoning, to throw into a ditch and cover up with stones. So if all burning, that is, pouring a spoonful of boiling lead into the inside, Herr Beheading. That means to cut off your head with a sword, like this. And he passes a hand across his neck. Then Chenek strangling. Do you hear? To strangle. Do you understand? And all for for making light of the Torah. For Bittal Torah. 
his heart is already sore for his victim but he is feeling his power over her for the first time and it has gone to his head silly woman he had never known how easy it was to frighten her that comes from making light of the torah he shouts and breaks off after all she might come to her senses at any moment and take up the broom he springs back to the table closes the gimra and hurries out of the room i am going to the house of study he calls out over his shoulder in a milder tone and shuts the door after him the loud voice and the noise of the closing door have waked the sick child the heavy-lidded eyes open the waxen face puckers and there is a peevish wail but she beside herself stands rooted to the spot and does not hear ah comes coarsely at last out of her narrow chest so that's it is it neither this world nor the other hanging he says stoning burning beheading strangling hanging by the tongue boiling lead poured into the inside he says for making light of the torah hanging ha 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 in desperation yes i'll hang but here here and soon what is there to wait for the child begins to cry louder still she does not hear a rope a rope she screams and stares wildly into every corner where is there a rope i wish he mayn't find a bone of me left let me be rid of one gehenna at any rate let him try it let him be a mother for once see how he likes it i've had enough of it let it be an atonement an end an end a rope a rope her last exclamation is like a cry for help from out of a conflagration she remembers that they have a rope somewhere yes under the stove the stove was to have been tied round against the winter the rope must be there still she runs and finds the rope the treasure looks up at the ceiling the hook that held the lamp she needs only climb on to the table she climbs but she sees from the table that the startled child weak as it is has sat up in the cradle and is reaching over the side it is trying to get out ma'am ma'am it sobs feebly a fresh paroxysm of anger seizes her she flings away the rope jumps off the table runs to the child and forces its head back into the pillow exclaiming bother the child it won't even let me hang myself i can't even hang myself in peace it wants to suck what is a good you will suck nothing but poison poison out of me i tell you there then greedy she cries in the same breath and stuffs her dried up breast into his mouth there then suck away bite end of a woman's wrath The Religious Difficulty Under Home Rule, The Nonconformist View, by Rev. Samuel Printer, M.A., D.D., Dublin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Religious Difficulty Under Home Rule, The Nonconformist View, by Rev. Samuel Printer, M.A., D.D., Dublin, moderator of general assembly of presbyterian church in ireland in 1904 through 5 from against home rule 1912 the case for the union for obvious reasons the religious difficulty under home rule does not receive much attention on the political platform in great britain but in ireland a religious problem flames at the heart of the whole controversy this religious problem creates the cleavage in the irish population and is the real secret of the intense passion on both sides with which home rule is both prosecuted and resisted irishmen understand this very well but as home rule on its face value is only a question of a mode of civil government it is almost impossible to make the matter clear to british electors they say what has religion got to do with home rule 
Home rule is a pure question of politics, and it must be solved on exclusively political lines. Even if this were so, might not Englishmen remember that the nationalist members of Parliament have been controlled by the Church of Rome in their votes on the English education question? I mention this to show that under the disguise of pure politics, ecclesiastical authority may stalk in perfect freedom through the lobbies of the House of Commons. It is, then, an absolutely incredible thing that what has been done in the English Parliament in the name of politics may be done openly and undisguised in the name of politics in a home rule Parliament. That such will be the case I shall now attempt to show. Let us begin with the most elementary facts. According to the official census of 1911, the population of Ireland is grouped as follows. Roman Catholics, 3,238,656. Irish Church, 575,489. Presbyterians, 439,876. Methodists, 61,806. All other Christian denominations, 57,718. Jews, 5,101. Information refused, 3,305. I beg the electors of Great Britain to look steadily into the above figures, and to ask themselves who are the home rulers, and who are the unionists in Ireland. Irish home rulers are almost all Roman Catholics, and the Protestants and others are almost all stout Unionists. Does this fact suggest nothing? How is it that the line of demarcation in Irish politics almost exactly coincides with the line of demarcation in religion? Quite true, there are a few Irish Roman Catholics who are Unionists, and a few Protestants who are home rulers. But they are so few and so uninfluential on both sides that the exception only serves to prove the rule. These exceptions, no doubt, have been abundantly exploited, and the very most has been made of them. But the great elementary fact remains that one-fourth of the Irish people, mostly Protestant, are resolutely and even passionately opposed to home rule. And the remarkable thing is that the most militant Irish Unionists for the past twenty years have not been the members of the Irish Church, who might be suspected of Protestant ascendancy prejudices, but they are the Presbyterians and Methodists, who never belong to the old Protestant ascendancy party. It is of Irish Presbyterians that I can speak with the most ultimate knowledge, their record in Ireland requires to be made perfectly clear. In 1829, they were the champions of Catholic emancipation. In 1868, they supported Mr. Gladstone in his great Irish reforms. They have been, at all times, the advocates of perfect equality in religion, and of unsectarianism in education. They stand firm and staunch on these two principles still but they are the sternest and strongest opponents of home rule and their reason is because home rule spells for ireland a new religious ascendancy and the destruction of the unsectarian principle in education i ask on these grounds that english and scottish electors should pause for a moment and open their minds to the fact that there is a great religious problem at the heart of home rule Irish Presbyterians claim that they know what they are doing, and that they are not the blind dupes of religious prejudice and political passion. It is for a great something that they have embarked in this conflict. They are determined to risk everything in this resistance, and in proportion as the danger approaches, in like proportion does their hostility to the Home Rule claim increase. What, then, is the secret of this determination? It lies in a nutshell. A parliament in Dublin would be under the control and domination of the Church of Rome. 
Two facts in Irish life render this not only likely and probable, but inevitable and certain. The first fact is that three-fourths of the members would be Roman Catholic. And the second fact is that the Irish people are the most devoted Roman Catholics at present in Christendom. No one disputes the first fact, but the second requires to be made clear to the electors of Great Britain. Let no one suppose that I am finding fault with Irishmen for being devoted Roman Catholics. What I wish to show is that the Church of Rome would be supreme in the new Parliament, and that she is not a good guardian of Protestant liberties and interests. Ireland has been for the last two generations brought into absolute captivity to the principles of ultramontanism. When Italy asserted her nationality and fought for it in 1870, Ireland sent out a brigade to fight on the side of the Pope. When France, a few years ago, broke up in that land the bondage of ecclesiasticism, the streets of Dublin were filled Sunday after Sunday for weeks with crowds of Irishmen headed by priests shouting for the Pope against France. The church first, nationality afterwards, is the creed of the ultramontane, and it is the avowed creed of the Irish people. But this would be changed in an Irish parliament, British electors affirm. Let us hear what Mr. John Dillon, MP, says on the point. Speaking about a year ago in the Free Trade Hall in Manchester, Mr. Dillon said, quote, I assert, and it is the glory of our race, that we are today the right arm of the Catholic Church throughout the world. We stand today as we have stood throughout without abating one jot or tittle of that faith, the most Catholic nation on the whole earth. Unquote. What Mr. Dillon says is perfectly true the Irish Parliament would be constituted on the Roman model. If there were none but Roman Catholics in Ireland, Ireland would rapidly become a state of the church. But how would Protestants fare? Just as they fared in old papal days in Italy under the temporal rule of the Vatican. But it may still be said that Irishmen themselves would curb the ecclesiastical power. This is one of the delusions by which British electors conceal from themselves the peril of home rule to Irish Protestants. They forget that Irishmen are, if possible, more Roman than Rome itself. I take the following picture of the Romanized condition of Ireland from a Roman Catholic writer. Quote, Mr. Frank Hugh O'Donnell, who believes in the Papal Church in every point, who accepts her teaching from Nikea to Trent, and from Trent to the Vatican, says, While the general population of Ireland has been going down by leaps and bounds to the abyss, the clerical population has been mounting by cent per cent during the same period. A short time ago, when an Austrian cabinet was being heckled by some anti-clerical op opponents upon its alleged encouragement of an excessive number of clerical persons in Austria, the minister replied, If you want to know what an excessive number of, of the clergy is like, go to Ireland. In proportion to their population, the Irish have got ten priests and nuns to the one who exists in Austria. I do not prejudge the question. They may be wanted in Ireland, but let not honorable members talk about over-clericalism in Austria until they have studied the clerical statistics of Ireland. A Jesuit visitor to Ireland, on returning to his English acquaintances, and being asked how did he find the priest in Ireland, replied, The priest in Ireland? There is nobody but priest in Ireland. Over there they are treading on one another's heels. While the population of Ireland has diminished one half, the population of the presbyteries and convents has multiplied threefold or more. Comparisons are then instituted between the sacerdotal census of Ireland and that of the European papal countries. I shall state results only. Belgium has only one archbishop and five bishops but if it were staffed with prelates on the Irish scale, it would have nine or ten archbishops and some sixty bishops. 
I suppose the main army of ecclesiastics in the two countries is in the same grossly incongruous proportions, ten or twelve priests in Ireland for everyone in Belgium. The German Empire, with its twenty-one million Roman Catholics, has actually fewer mitred prelates than Ireland, with its three million of Roman Catholics. The figures of Austria-Hungary, with its Roman Catholic population of 36 million, are equally impressive. It has 11 archbishops, but if it were staffed on the Irish scale, it would have 48. It has 40 bishops, but if it were like Ireland, it would have 288. Mr. O'Donnell goes on, quote, This enormous population of churchmen, far beyond the necessities and even the luxuries of religious worship and service would be a heavy tax upon the resources of great and wealthy lands what must it be for ireland to have to supply the episcopal villas the new cathedrals and handsome presbyteries and handsome incomes of this enormous and increasing host of reverend gentlemen who as regards five-sixths of their number contribute neither to the spiritual nor temporal felicity of the island they are the despotic managers of all primary schools and can exact what homage they please from the poor serf teachers whom they dominate and whom they keep eternally under their thumb they absolutely own and control all the secondary schools with all their private profits and all their government grants in the university what they do not dominate they mutilate every appointment from dispensary doctors to members of parliament must acknowledge their ownership and pay toll to their despotism the county councils must contribute patronage according to their indications the parish committees of the congested districts supplement their pocket money they have annexed the revenues of the industrial schools they are engaged in transforming the universal proprietary of ireland in order to add materials for their exactions from the living and the moribund i am told that not less than seventy five million are lifted from the irish people every year by the innumerable agencies of clerical suction which are at work upon all parts of the irish body politic and social nor can it be forgotten that the material loss is only a portion of the injury. The browbeaten and an intimidated condition of the popular action and intelligence which is necessary to this state of things necessarily communicates its want of will and energy to every function of the community. Unquote. Of course, Mr. F. H. O'Donnell has been driven out of public life in Ireland for plain speaking like this, and so would every man be who ventured to cross swords with his church. It aggravates the situation immensely when we take another fact in Irish life into account. In quite recent months, Mr. Devlin, M.P., has brought up into prominence a society called the Ancient Order of Hibernians, sometimes called the Molly Maguires, which, according to the late Mr. Michael Davitt, is, quote, the most wonderful pro-Celtic organization in the world, unquote. This is a secret society which at one time was under the ban of the church, but quite recently the ban has been removed, and priests are now allowed to join the order. The present pope is said to be its most powerful friend. It has branches in many lands, and it is rapidly gathering into it all the great mass of the Irish Roman Catholic people. This is the most wonderful political machine in Ireland. Mr. William O'Brien, M.P., has recently given an account of the society which has never been seriously questioned. Quote, the fundamental object of the Hibernian society is to give preference to its own members first and catholics afterwards as against protestants on all occasions whether it is a question of custom office public contracts or positions on public boards 
Molly Maguires are pledged always to support a Catholic as against a Protestant. If Protestants are to be robbed of their businesses, if they are to be deprived of public contracts, if they are to be shut out of every office of honor or emolument, what is this but extermination? The domination of such a society would make this country a hell. It would light the flame of civil war in our midst and blight every hope of its future prosperity." Unquote. And now we reach the core of the question. It is perfectly clear that home rule would create a Roman Catholic ascendancy in Ireland, but still it might be said that the Church of Rome would be tolerant. On that point, we had best consult the Church of Rome herself. Has she ever said that she would practice toleration towards Protestants when she was in power? Never. On the contrary, she declares most clearly that toleration of error is a deadly sin. In this respect, the Church of Rome claims to differ toto colio from the churches of the Reformation. In Ireland, she has passed through all the stages of ecclesiastical experience, from the lowest form of disability to the present claim of supremacy. In the dark days of her suffering, she cried for toleration, and as the claim was just in Protestant eyes, she got it. Then, as she grew in strength, she stretched forth her hands for equality, and as this too was just, she gradually obtained it. At present, she enjoys equality in every practical right and privilege with her Protestant neighbors. But, in the demand for home rule, there is involved the claim of exerting an ecclesiastical ascendancy not only over her own members, but over Irish Protestants, and this is the claim which is unjust, and which ought not to be granted. Green, the historian, points out that William Pitt made the union with England the ground of his plea for Roman Catholic emancipation, as it would effectually prevent a Romish ascendancy in Ireland. Home rule, in practice, will destroy the control of Great Britain, and therefore involves the removal of the bulwark against Roman Catholic ascendancy. The contention of the Irish Protestants is that neither their will nor their religious liberties would be safe in the custody of Rome. In an Irish Parliament, civil allegiance to the Holy See would be the test of membership and would make every Roman Catholic member a civil servant of the Vatican. That Parliament would be compelled to carry out the behests of the Church. The Church is hostile to the liberty of the press, to liberty of public speech, to modernism in science, in literature, in philosophy, is bound to exact obedience from her own members and to extirpate heresy and heretics. Claims to be above civil law and the right to enforce canon law wherever she is able. There are simply no limits, even of life or property, to the range of her intolerance. This is not an indictment. It is the boast of Rome. She plumes herself upon being intolerant because she is an infallible church, and her Irish claim, symbolized by the papal tiara, is supremacy over the church, supremacy over the state, and supremacy over the invisible world. Unquestioning obedience is her law towards her own subjects, and intolerance tempered with prudence is her law towards Protestants. It is a strange hallucination to find that there are politicians today who think that Rome will change her principles at the bidding of Mr. Redman, or to please hard-driven politicians, or to make Rome attractive to a Protestant empire. Rome claims supremacy, and she tells us quite candidly what she will do when she gets it. Here is our difficulty under home rule. Irish Protestants see that they must either refuse to go into an Irish Parliament, or else go into it as a hopeless minority, and turn it into an arena for the maintenance of their most elementary rights, in which case the Irish Parliament would be simply a cockpit of religio-political strife. But it would be a great mistake 
to suppose that the religious difficulty is confined to Irish Protestants. It is a difficulty which would become in time a crushing burden to Roman Catholics themselves. The yoke of Rome was found too heavy for Italy, and in a generation or two it would be found too heavy for Ireland. But for the creation of the papal ascendancy in Ireland, the responsibility must rest in the long run on Great Britain herself. England and Scotland, the most favored lands of the Reformation, by establishing home rule in Ireland, will do for Rome what no other country in the world would do for her they would entrust her with a legislative machine which she could control without check hand over to her tender mercies a million of the best protestants of the empire and establish at the heart of the empire a power altogether at variance with her own ideals of government fraught with danger and a good base of operations for the conquest of england can this be done with impunity can great britain divest herself of a religious responsibility in dealing with home rule is there not a god in heaven who will take note of such national procedure are electors not responsible to him for the use they make of their votes if they sow to the wind must they not reap the whirlwind in brief compass i hope i have made it quite clear what the religious difficulty in Ireland under home rule is. It is not a mere accident of the situation. It does not spring from any question of temper, or of prejudice, or of bigotry. The religious difficulty is created by the essential and fundamental genius of Romanism. Her whole ideal of life differs from the Protestant ideal. It is impossible to reconcile these two ideals it is impossible to unite them in any amalgam that would not mean the destruction of both under imperial rule these ideals have discovered a decently working modus vivendi mr pitt's contention that the union with great britain would be an effectual barrier against romanism has held good but if you remove imperial rule then you create at a stroke the ascendancy of rome and under that ascendancy the greatest injustice would be inflicted on the protestant minority questions of public situations and of efficient patronage are of very subordinate importance indeed mr redmond demands that irish protestants must be included in his home rule scheme and threatens that if they object they must be dealt with quote, by the strong hand unquote, and his home rule parliament would be subservient to the church of rome does anyone suppose that a million of the most earnest protestants in the world are going to submit to such an arrangement neither englishmen nor scotsmen would be willing themselves to enter under such a yoke and why should they ask irishmen to do so it is contended, indeed, that the power of the priest in Ireland is on the wane. This is partly true and partly not true. It is true that he is not quite the political and social autocrat that he once was. But it is not true that the Church of Rome is less powerful in Ireland than she was. On the contrary, as an ecclesiastical organization, Rome was never so compact in organization never so ably manned by both regular and secular clergy, never so wealthy nor so full of resource, never so obedient to the rule of the Vatican as at the present moment. Give her an Irish parliament, and she will be complete. She will patiently subdue all Ireland to her will. Emigration has drained the country of the strong men of the laity, who might be able to resist her encroachments dr horton truly says quote, the roman church dominates ireland and the irish as completely as islam dominates morocco unquote. by ireland and the irish dr horton of course means roman catholic ireland are you now going to place a legislative weapon in her hand whereby she will be able to dominate protestants also it is bad statesmanship bad politics bad religion 
For Ireland it can bring nothing but ruin, and for the empire nothing but terrible retribution in the future. End of The Religious Difficulty Under Home Rule, The Nonconformist View By Rev. Samuel Printer, M.A.D.D., Dublin The Art of Denmark, an Epistolary Preface, by Carl Madsen, Director of the Royal Gallery at Copenhagen, from Exhibition of Contemporary Scandinavian Art under the Auspices of the American Scandinavian Society. Reading by Bologna Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Art of Denmark by Carl Madsen My dear Christian Brenton, Surely you still remember the pavilion on Langolini, where two or three times we lunched so congenially together. Through the great windows of the restaurant we had an outlook eastward over the sound and the ships westward over the tranquil moat to the green trees of the citadel where we heard at times a blackbird's whistle. In the restaurant, near the entrance, sat loyal German tourists with beer mugs and souvenir postcards. At other tables, my countrymen were laughing at their own jokes. We Danes are, as you correctly observed, a people who are fond of amusing ourselves, and who do not think very much about the morrow. Indeed, altogether too little. Sometimes, however, on beautiful summer evenings, you will meet people here who, silent and dreaming, gaze out over the sea. This, also, is perhaps characteristic of our nation. We have grown up with Anderson's fairy tales, and have had other good authors with whom you are doubtless familiar. When from Langeline, I see the beautiful clouds floating over a gently rocking sea. I often find myself recalling an artist who, near a hundred years ago, long before the pavilion was built and souvenir postcards were invented, went modestly on his evening walks from his professor's quarters in the academy of Congens Nitorv out to this spot. He was neither poet nor dreamer. His sharp eyes made purely scientific observations upon the formation of clouds. He examined the construction of ships with the eye of a professional, and sought to explain the laws governing the perspective of these shifting waves. The artistic ambition of this upright soul was to give the most precise picture possible of nature, as true as a mirror. His canvases are old-fashioned. All objects present themselves as those seen through a strong field glass, but the tones are fine and clear as day. When I now look from Langelini out across the sea, Danish painting in later years does not seem to have produced works that, in striking fidelity to nature, surpass those of Eckersberg. And over there, in the citadel, behind the tranquil moat, his pupil, Kopke, had his home. Even today, both in fact and in the art of Kopke, these old fortifications are an idyllic spot. His sister's pink dress against the green trees of the rampart, the sunshine on an empty wagon in the Citadel bakery yard, the Dannenbrog flying over a boat landing, or a pair of poplars in the twilight, were for Kopke, motives sufficiently rich in interest. You, dear Mr. Brenton, at once understood how to value his pictures from these realms of peace, his portraits of relatives, friends, and plain townsfolk. They are as modest and unpretentious as the violets on the citadel terrace. When Marstrand, Kopke's contemporary and fellow pupil, Imder Eckersberg walked here on Langelene. He looked, I fancy, with greater interest upon the promenaders than on the sea and the citadel. Here he must have met young girls, whose graceful necks, 
blushing cheeks and bright eyes reminded him of the beautiful women of rome unforgettable memories of his youthful student days here too he met droll copenhagen types who served as capital models for his character figures from holberg's comedies and perhaps also the tall gaunt officers he may have used for his representations of don quixote marstrand the most richly endowed and many-sided of our older painters had himself the noble knight's thirst for lofty deeds his sketches and drawings show a vast range of happy inspiration but when he had to carry out his work according to the demands of the time evil and invincible forces paralyzed his hand the coloring became crude the form characterless the features rigid and life itself had departed during this entire period exact execution was regarded as the hallmark of respectable painting in all of our art from eckersburg down this was held in highest honor it was the flowering time of the so-called national art poets had sung the praises of the fatherland and an eloquent critic pointed out the importance of purely native themes landscape painters sought to epitomize the peculiar beauty of danish nature genre painters glorified the danish peasantry art they held should be danish in form as well as content and borrow nothing from other nations in our separation from the world many virtues f flourished but also many vices for of course men ought to strive to be themselves yet as henrik ibsen says only the devil is self-sufficient and so when danish painting came to be exhibited at the world's exposition at paris in eighteen seventy eight it made such a sorry showing that an old danish artist seriously believed that the canvases were covered with dust which had been overlooked in cleaning it stuck so tight and so thick that they seemed lustreless poor in color and strangely antiquated for this reason several young danish painters went to school in paris and in due course brought home new conceptions of the aim of painting later other danish artists when they had opportunity have looked about in the world though it cannot be said that they have learned over much from foreign art we are a little nation and our national independence is for us the most precious quality we possess a local newspaper has recently given some solid advice regarding the forthcoming exhibition of danish art in america regard for the purely artistic merit of the canvases ought as a matter of principle to be subordinated it is far more important that the pictures bear the familiar national stamp as yet i do not definitely know how the exhibition which is shortly to be placed before the tribunal of america will be constituted but i know that you dear mr brenton have wished that it might be free from banalities you have preferred the characteristic to the commonplace the fresh to the dusty the vigorous to the vapid you have sought to combine that which in your opinion is good art with that which recommends itself as national and in any event the exhibition would not have lacked the national impress this factor does not depend upon a peculiar manner of treatment or style of painting tiepolo is just as italian as botticelli nor does the national note depend upon subject every good artist expresses his nationality in new forms the invited painters are all legitimate children of their land, and many of them have inherited some of their best qualities from those same artists who, beside the sound and in the citadel, founded the Danish school of painting. Truthfulness is quite as precious to Ring as to Beckersburg, and Wilhelm Hammerschei has seen, just as Kepke, that the most unobtrusive lives and the simplest scenes and incidents 
can contain a world of marvelous poetry. But the individual characterization of these painters I resign to you, my dear Mr. Brinton. You have studied our art with a sympathetic interest and understanding for which I offer you my heartfelt thanks. Yours sincerely, Carl Modson. End of The Art of Denmark An Epistolary Preface by Carl Madsen A Railway Journey from The Day Before Yesterday by Richard Middleton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times. A Railway Journey by Richard Middleton. I suppose that when little boys made their journeys by coach, with David Copperfield, or Tom Brown, and his pea-shooting comrades, they did in truth find adventure easier to achieve than we who were born in an age of railways. But though the rarer joys of far travel by road were denied us, it did not need Mr. Rudyard Kipling, in a didactic mood, to convince us that there was plenty of romance in railway journeys if you approached them in the right spirit. We were as fond as playing at trains as most small boys, and a stationary engine with the light of the furnace glowing on the grim face of the driver was a disquieting feature of all my nightmares. So when the grown-up people announced that one of us was to make a long journey, young Ulysses became, for the moment, an envied and enchanted figure. Our Periodical excursions to London were well enough in their way. Noisy, jolly parties, in reserved carriages, to pantomimes and the Lord Mayor's show, or matter-of-fact visits to the dentist or the shops. But we all knew the features of the landscape on the way to London by heart, and it was the thought of voyaging through the unknown that fired our lively blood, our hazy sense of geography, enabling us to believe that all manner of marvels were to be seen by young eyes from English railway carriages. Also, we did not feel that we were real travelers until we had left all our own grown-ups behind, though in such circumstances we had to put up with the indignity of being confided to the care of the guard. Until children have votes, they will continue to suffer from such slights as this. One morning, in early spring, I left London for the north. The adult who saw me off performed his task on the whole very well. True, he introduced me to the guard, a bearded and sinister man. But on the other hand, he realized the importance of my having a corner seat, and only once or twice committed the error of treating me as if I were a parcel. For my part, I was at pains to conceal my excitement beneath the mannerisms of an experienced traveller. I put the windows up and down several times, and read aloud all the notices concerning luncheon baskets and danger signals. Then my companion shook hands with me in a sensible, manly fashion, and the train started. I sat back and examined my fellow travellers, and found them rather disappointing. There were three ladies, manifestly of the aunt kind, and a stiff, well-behaved little girl, who might have stepped out of one of my sister's story-books. She was reading a book without pictures, and when I turned over the pages of my magazines, she displayed no interest in them whatever. I could never read in the train, so, with a tentative effort at good manners, I pushed them towards her, but she shook her head. To show her that I did not think this was a snub, I pulled out my packet of sandwiches and had my lunch. After that I played with the blind, which worked with a spring, until one of the aunts told me not to fidget, although she was no aunt of mine. Then I looked out of the window, a prey to voiceless wrath. 
By now we had left London far behind, and when I had finished composing imaginary retorts to the unscrupulous aunt, I was quite content to see the wonders of the world flit by. There were hills and valleys decked with romantic woods and set with fascinating and secretive ponds. To my eyes the hills were mountains and the valleys perilous hollows, the accustomed lairs of tremendous dragons. I saw little thatched houses wherein swart witches awaited the coming of Hansel and Gretel, and fairy children waved to me from cottage gardens and the gates of level crossings, greetings which I dutifully returned until the aunt made me pull up the window. After a while a change came over the scenery. The placid greens and browns of the countryside blossomed to gold and purple and crimson. I saw a rock float across the arching sky on sluggish wings, and my eyes were delighted with visions of deserts and mosques and palm trees. That my fellow passengers would not raise their heads to behold these marvels did not trouble me. I beat on the window with delight, until, like little Billy in Thackeray's ballad, I saw Jerusalem and Madagascar and North and South America. Then something surprising happened. I saw the earth leap up and invade the sky, and the sky drop down and blot out the earth, and I felt as though my wings were broken. Then the sides of the carriage closed in and squeezed out the door like a pip out of an orange, until there was only a three-cornered gap left. The air was full of dust, and I sneezed again and again, but could not find my pocket handkerchief. Presently a young man came and lifted me out through the hole, and seemed very surprised that I was not hurt. I realized that there had been an accident, for the train was broken into pieces, and the permanent way was very untidy. Close at hand I saw the little girl sitting on a bank, and a man kneeling at her feet, taking her boots off. I would have liked to speak to her, but I remembered how she had refused the offer of my magazines, and was afraid she would snub me again. The place was very noisy, for people were calling out, and there was a great sound of steam. I noticed that everybody's face was very white, especially the guard's, which made his beard seem as black as soot. The young man took me by the hand, and led me along the uneven ground, and there was so much to see that my feet kept stumbling over things, and he had to hold me up. On the way we passed the body of a man lying with a rug over his head. I knew that he was dead, but I had seen drunken men in the streets lie like that, and I could not help looking about for the policeman. Soon we came to a little station, and the platform was crowded with people, who would not stand still, but walked round and round making noises. When I climbed up on the platform, a woman caught hold of me and cried over me. One of her tears fell on my ear and tickled me, but she held me so tightly that I could not put up my hand to rub it. Her breath was hot on my head. Then I heard a detested voice say, Poor little boy, so tired! and I shuddered back into consciousness of the world that was least interesting of all the worlds I knew. I need not have opened my eyes to be sure that the aunts were at their fell work again, and that the little girl's snub nose was tilted to a patronizing angle. Had I awakened a minute later, she, too, would have joined in the auntish chorus of compassion for my weakness. As it was, I looked at her with drowsy pity, finding that she was one of those luckless infants who might as well stay at home, for all the fun they get out of traveling. She knew no better than to scream when the train ran into a tunnel. What would she have done if she had seen my rock? The train ran on and on, and still I throned it in my corner, awake or dreaming, indisputably master of all the things that counted. The three aunts faded into antimacassars. The little girl endured her uninteresting life, and became an aunt and an antimacassar in her turn. And still I swung my legs in my corner seat, 
a boy errant in the strange places of the world. I do not remember the name of the station at which the bearded guard ultimately brought me out of my dreams. I do remember standing stiffly on the platform and deciding that I had been traveling night and day for three hundred years. When I communicated this fact to the relatives who met me, they were strangely unimpressed. But I knew that when I returned home to my brothers, they would display a decent interest in the story of my wanderings. After all, you can't expect grown-up people to understand everything. End of A Railway Journey by Richard Middleton The Sinking of the Titanic, Seen from a Lifeboat, from The Loss of the S.S. Titanic, Its Story and Its Lessons, by Lawrence Beasley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Reading by Bologna Times The Sinking of the Titanic, Seen from a Lifeboat Looking back now on the descent of our boat down the ship's side, it is a matter of surprise, I think, to all the occupants to remember how little they thought of it at the time. It was a great adventure, certainly. It was exciting to feel the boat sink by jerks, foot by foot, as the ropes were paid out from above and shrieked as they passed through the pulley blocks, the new ropes and gear creaking under the strain of a boat laden with people, and the crew calling to the sailors above as the boat tilted slightly, now at one end, now at the other. Lower aft, lower stern, and lower together, as she came level again. But I do not think we felt much apprehension about reaching the water safely. It certainly was thrilling to see the black hull of the ship on one side, and the sea, seventy feet below, on the other, or to pass down by cabins and saloons brilliantly lighted. But we knew nothing of the apprehension felt in the minds of some of the officers whether the boats and lowering gear would stand the strain of the weight of our sixty people. The ropes, however, were new and strong, and the boat did not buckle in the middle as an older boat might have done. Whether it was right or not to lower the boats full of people to the water, and it seems likely it was not, I think there can be nothing but the highest praise given to the officers and crew above for the way in which they lowered the boats, one after the other, safely to the water. It may seem a simple matter to read about such a thing, but any sailor knows, apparently, that it is not so. An experienced officer has told me that he has seen a boat lowered in practice from a ship's deck with a trained crew and no passengers in the boat, with practiced sailors paying out the ropes in daylight, in calm weather, with the ship lying in dock, and has seen the boat tilt over and pitch the crew headlong into the sea. Contrast these conditions with those obtaining that Monday morning at 12.45 a.m., and it is impossible not to feel that, whether the lowering crew were trained or not, whether they had or had not drilled since coming on board, that they did their duty in a way that argues the greatest efficiency. I cannot help feeling the deepest gratitude to the two sailors who stood at the ropes above and lowered us to the sea. I do not suppose they were saved. Perhaps one explanation of our feeling little sense of the unusual in leaving the Titanic in this way was that it seemed the climax to a series of extraordinary occurrences. The magnitude of the whole thing dwarfed events that in the ordinary way would seem to be full of imminent peril. It is easy to imagine it, a voyage of four days on a calm sea without a single untoward incident. The presumption, perhaps already mentally half realized, that we should be ashore in forty-eight hours, and so complete a splendid voyage, and then to feel the engine stop, to be summoned on deck with little time to dress, to tie on a life-belt, to see rockets shooting aloft and call for help, to be told to get into a lifeboat. After all these things, it did not seem much to feel the boat sinking down to the sea. It was the natural sequence of previous events, 
and we had learned in the last hour to take things just as they came. At the same time, if anyone should wonder what the sensation is like, it is quite easy to measure seventy-five feet from the windows of a tall house or a block of flats, look down to the ground, and fancy himself with some sixty other people crowded into a boat so tightly that he could not sit down or move about, and then picture the boat sinking down in a continuous series of jerks as the sailors pay out the ropes through cleats above. There are more pleasant sensations than this. How thankful we were that the sea was calm, and the Titanic lay so steadily and quietly as we dropped down her side. We were spared the bumping and grinding against the side which so often accompanies the launching of boats. I do not remember that we even had to fend off our boat while we were trying to get free. As we went down, one of the crew shouted, we are just over the condenser exhaust. We don't want to stay in that long or we shall be swamped. Feel down on the floor and be ready to pull up the pin which lets the ropes free as soon as we are afloat. I had often looked over the side and noticed the stream of water coming out of the side of the Titanic just above the water line. In fact, so large was the volume of water that as we plowed along and met the waves coming towards us, this stream would cause a splash that sent spray flying. We felt, as well as we could in the crowd of people on the floor, along the sides, with no idea where the pen could be found, and none of the crew knew where it was, only of its existence somewhere, but we never found it. And all the time we got closer to the sea, and the exhaust roared nearer and nearer, until finally we floated with the ropes still holding us from above the exhaust washing us away, and the force of the tide driving us back against the side, the latter not of much account in influencing the direction, however. Thinking over what followed, I imagine we must have touched the water with the condenser stream at our bows, and not in the middle as I thought at one time. At any rate, the resultant of these three forces was that we were carried parallel to the ship, directly under the place where boat 15 would drop from her davits into the sea. Looking up, we saw her already coming down rapidly from B-deck. She must have filled almost immediately after ours. We shouted up, Stop lowering 14! Footnote. In an account which appeared in the newspapers of April 19, I have described this boat as 14, not knowing they were numbered alternately and the crew and passengers in the boat above, hearing us shout and seeing our position immediately below them, shouted the same to the sailors on the boat deck. But apparently they did not hear, for she dropped down foot by foot. Twenty feet, fifteen, ten, and a stoker and I in the bows reached up and touched her bottom, swinging above our heads, trying to push away from our boat from under her. It seemed now as if nothing could prevent her dropping on us, but at this moment another stoker sprang with his knife to the ropes that still held us, and I heard him shout, One! Two! as he cut them through. The next moment we had swung away from underneath fifteen, and were clear of her as she dropped into the water, in the space we had just before occupied. I do not know how the bell ropes were freed, but imagine that they were cut in the same way, for we were washed clear of the Titanic at once by the force of the stream and floated away as the oars were got out. I think we all felt that that was quite the most exciting thing we had yet been through, and a great sigh of relief and gratitude went up as we swung away from the boat above our heads. But I heard no one cry aloud during the experience. Not a woman's voice was raised in fear or hysteria. I think we all learnt many things that night about the bogey called fear, and how the facing of it is much less than the dread of it. The crew was made up of cooks and stewards, mostly the former, I think, their white jackets showing up in the darkness as they pulled away, two to an oar. I do not think they can have had any practice in rowing, for all night long their oars crossed and clashed. If our safety had depended on speed or accuracy in keeping time, it would have gone hard with us. 
Shouting began from one end of the boat to the other as to what we should do, where we should go, and no one seemed to have any knowledge how to act. At last we asked, Who is in charge of this boat? But there was no reply. We then agreed by general consent that the stoker, who stood in the stern with the tiller, should act as captain. And from that time he directed the course, shouting to other boats and keeping in touch with them. Not that there was anywhere to go, or anything we could do. Our plan of action was simple, to keep all the boats together as far as possible, and wait until we were picked up by other liners. The crew had apparently heard of the wireless communications before they left the Titanic, but I never heard them say that we were in touch with any boat but the Olympic. It was always the Olympic that was coming to our rescue. They thought they knew even her distance, and making a calculation, we came to the conclusion that we ought to be picked up by her about two o'clock in the afternoon. But this was not our only hope of rescue. We watched all the time the darkness lasted for steamer's lights, thinking there might be a chance of other steamers coming near enough to see the lights which some of our boats carried. I am sure there was no feeling in the minds of any one that we should not be picked up next day. We knew that wireless messages would go out from ship to ship, and as one of the stokers said, The sea will be covered with ships tomorrow afternoon. They will race up from all over the sea to find us. Some even thought that fast torpedo boats might run up ahead of the Olympic, and yet the Olympic was, after all, the farthest away of them all. Eight other ships lay within three hundred miles of us. How thankful we should have been to know how near help was, and how many ships had heard our message and were rushing to the Titanic's aid. I think nothing has surprised us more than to learn so many ships were near enough to rescue us in a few hours. Almost immediately after leaving the Titanic, we saw what we all said was a ship's lights down on the horizon on the Titanic's port side. Two lights, one above the other, and plainly not one of our boats. We even rowed in that direction for some time, but the lights drew away and disappeared below the horizon. But this is rather anticipating. We did none of these things first. We had no eyes for anything but the ship we had just left. As the oarsmen pulled slowly away, we all turned and took a long look at the mighty vessel towering high above our midget boat, and I know it must have been the most extraordinary sight I shall ever be called upon to witness. I realize now how totally inadequate language is to convey to some other person who was not there any real impression of what we saw. But the task must be attempted. The whole picture is so intensely dramatic that, while it is not possible to place on paper for eyes to see the actual likeness of the ship as she lay there, some sketch of the scene will be possible. First of all, the climatic conditions were extraordinary. The night was one of the most beautiful I have ever seen. The sky, without a single cloud to mar, the perfect brilliance of the stars, clustered so thickly together that in places there seemed almost more dazzling points of light set in the black sky than background of sky itself. And each star seemed, in the keen atmosphere, free from any haze, to have increased its brilliance tenfold, and to twinkle and glitter with a staccato flash that made the sky seem nothing but a setting made for them in which to display their wonder. They seemed so near, and their light so much more intense than ever before, that fancy suggested they saw this beautiful ship in dire distress below, and all their energies had awakened to flash messages across the black dome of the sky to each other, telling and warning of the calamity happening in the world beneath. Later, when the Titanic had gone down, and we lay still on the sea, waiting for the day to dawn, or a ship to come, I remember looking up at the perfect sky and realizing why Shakespeare wrote the beautiful words he puts in the mouth of Lorenzo. Jessica, look how the floor of heaven is thick and laid with patines of bright gold. There's not the smallest orb which thou beholdest, but in his motion like an angel sings, still choiring to the young-eyed cherubims. Such harmony is in 
immortal souls but whilst this muddy vesture of decay doth grossly close it in we cannot hear it but it seemed almost as if we could that night the stars seemed really to be alive and to talk the complete absence of haze produced a phenomenon i had never seen before where the sky met the sea the line was as clear and definite as the edge of a knife so that the water and the air never merged gradually into each other and blended to a softened rounded horizon but each element was so exclusively separate that where a star came low down in the sky near the clear-cut edge of the water line it still lost none of its brilliance as the earth revolved and the water edge came up and covered partially the star as it were it simply cut the star in two the upper half continuing to sparkle as long as it was not entirely hidden and throwing a long beam of light along the sea to us in the evidence before the united states senate committee the captain of one of the ships near us that night said the stars were so extraordinarily bright near the horizon that he was deceived into thinking that they were ship's lights he did not remember seeing such a night before those who were afloat will all agree with that statement we were often deceived into thinking they were lights of a ship and next the cold air here again was something quite new to us there was not a breath of wind to blow keenly round us as we stood in the boat and because of its continued persistence to make us feel cold it was just a keen bitter icy motionless cold that came from nowhere and yet was there all the time the stillness of it if one can imagine cold being motionless and still was what seemed new and strange and these the sky and the air were overhead and below was the sea here again something uncommon the surface was like a lake of oil heaving gently up and down with a quiet motion that rocked our boat dreamily to and fro we did not need to keep her head to the swell often i watched her lying broadside on to the tide and with a boat loaded as we were this would have been impossible with anything like a swell the sea slipped away smoothly under the boat and i think we never heard it lapping on the sides so oily in appearance was the water so when one of the stokers said he had been to sea for twenty-six years and never yet seen such a calm night we accepted it as true without comment just as expressive was the remark of another it reminds me of a bloomin picnic it was quite true it did a picnic on a lake or a quiet inland river like the cam or a backwater on the thames and so in these conditions of sky and air and sea we gazed broadside on the titanic from a short distance she was absolutely still indeed from the first it seemed as if the blow from the iceberg had taken all the courage out of her and she had just come quietly to rest and was settling down without an effort to save herself without a murmur of protest against such a foul blow for the sea could not rock her the wind was not there to howl noisily round the decks and make the ropes hum from the first what must have impressed all as they watched was the sense of stillness about her and the slow insensible way she sank lower and lower in the sea like a stricken animal the mere bulk alone of the ship viewed from the sea below was an awe-inspiring sight imagine a ship nearly a sixth of a mile long seventy-five feet high to the top decks with four enormous funnels above the decks and masts again high above the funnels with her hundreds of portholes all her saloons and other rooms brilliant with light and all round her little boats filled with those who until a few hours before had trod her decks and read in her libraries and listened to the music of her band in happy content and who were now looking up in amazement at the enormous mass above them and rowing away from her because she was sinking i had often wanted to see her from some distance away 
and only a few hours before, in conversation at lunch with a fellow passenger, had registered a vow to get a proper view of her lines and dimensions when we landed at New York. To stand some distance away to take in a full view of her beautiful proportions, which the narrow approach to the dock at Southampton made impossible. Little did I think that the opportunity was to be found so quickly and so dramatically. The background, too, was a different one from what I had planned for her. The black outline of her profile against the sky was bordered all round by stars studded in the sky, and all her funnels and masts were picked out in the same way. Her bulk was seen where the stars were blotted out. And one other thing was different from expectation. The thing that ripped away from us instantly, as we saw it, all sense of the beauty of the night, the beauty of the ship's lines, and the beauty of her lights, and all these taken in themselves, were intensely beautiful. That thing was the awful angle made by the level of the sea, with the rows of porthole lights along her side, in dotted lines, row above row. The sea level and the rows of lights should have been parallel, should never have met and now they met at an angle inside the black hull of the ship. There was nothing else to indicate she was injured, nothing but this apparent violation of a simple geometrical law that parallel lines should never meet, even if produced ever so far both ways. But it meant the Titanic had sunk by the head until the lowest portholes in the bows were under the sea, and the portholes in the stern were lifted above the normal height. We rode away from her in the quietness of the night, hoping and praying with all our hearts that she would sink no more, and the day would find her still in the same position as she was then. The crew, however, did not think so. It has been said frequently that the officers and crew felt assured that she would remain afloat even after they knew the extent of the damage. Some of them may have done so and perhaps, from their scientific knowledge of her construction, with more reason at the time than those who said she would sink, but at any rate the stokers in our boat had no such illusion. One of them, I think he was the same man that cut us free from the pulley ropes, told us how he was at work in the stoke hole, and in anticipation of going off duty in quarter of an hour, thus confirming the time of the collision as 11.45 had near him a pan of soup keeping hot on some part of the machinery. Suddenly the whole side of the compartment came in, and the water rushed him off his feet. Picking himself up, he sprang for the compartment doorway, and was just through the aperture when the watertight door came down behind him, like a knife, as he said. They worked them from the bridge. He had gone up on deck, but was ordered down again at once, and with others was told to draw the fires from under the boiler, which they did, and were then at liberty to come on deck again. It seems that this particular knot of stokers must have known almost as soon as any one of the extent of injury. He added mournfully, I could do with that hot soup now. And indeed he could. He was clad at the time of the collision, he said, in trousers and singlet, both very thin on account of the intense heat in the stoke hole, and although he had added a short jacket later, his teeth were chattering with the cold. He found a place to lie down underneath the tiller on the little platform where our captain stood, and there he lay all night with a coat belonging to another stoker thrown over him, and I think he must have been almost unconscious. A lady next to him, who was warmly clad with several coats, tried to insist on his having one of hers, a fur-lined one, thrown over him, but he absolutely refused, while some of the women were insufficiently clad, and so the coat was given to an Irish girl, with pretty auburn hair standing near, leaning against the gunwale, with an outside berth, and so more exposed to the cold air. This same lady was able to distribute more of her wraps to the passengers, a rug to one, a fur boa to another, and she has related the amusement that, at the moment of climbing up the Carpathia's side, those to whom these articles had been lent offered them all back to her, but as, 
like the rest of us, she was encumbered with a life belt. She had to say she would receive them back at the end of the climb. I had not seen my dressing gown since I dropped into the boat, but some time in the night a steerage passenger found it on the floor and put it on. It is not easy at this time to call to mind who were in the boat, because in the night it was not possible to see more than a few feet away, and when dawn came we had eyes only for the rescue ship and the icebergs. But so far as my memory serves, the list was as follows. No first-class passengers. Three women, one baby, two men from the second cabin, and the other passengers' steerage, mostly women. A total of about thirty-five passengers. The rest, about twenty-five, and possibly more, were crew and stokers. Near to me all night was a group of three Swedish girls, warmly clad, standing close together to keep warm, and very silent. Indeed, there was very little talking at any time. One conversation took place that is, I think, worth repeating. One more proof that the world, after all, is a small place. The ten months old baby, which was handed down at the last moment, was received by a lady next to me, the same who shared her wraps and coats. The mother had found a place in the middle, and was too tightly packed to come through to the child, and so it slept contentedly for about an hour in the, a stranger's arms. It then began to cry, and the temporary nurse said, "'Will you feel down and see if the baby's feet are out of the blanket?' I don't know much about babies, but I think their feet must be kept warm. Wriggling down as well as I could, I found its toes exposed to the air, and wrapped them well up, when it ceased crying at once. It was evidently a successful diagnosis. Having recognized the lady by her voice, it was much too dark to see faces. As one of my vis a vis at the purser's table, I said, "'Surely you are Miss... Um, yes,' she replied. "'And who must be Mr. Beasley? "'How curious we should find ourselves in the same boat.' "'Remembering that she had joined the boat at Queenstown, I said, "'Do you know Clonmel? "'A letter from a great friend of mine who was staying there at... "'Giving the address. "'Came aboard at Queenstown. "'Yes, it is my home, and I was dining at just before I came away. It seemed that she knew my friend, too, and we agreed that, of all places in the world to recognize mutual friends, a crowded lifeboat afloat in mid-ocean at 2 a.m., 1,200 miles from our destination, was one of the most unexpected. And all the time, as we watched, the Titanic sank lower and lower by the head, and the angle became wider and wider, as the stern porthole lights lifted, and the bow lights sank, and it was evident she was not to stay afloat much longer. The Captain Stoker now told the oarsmen to row away as hard as they could. Two reasons seemed to make this a wise decision. One, that as she sank she would create such a wave of suction that boats, if not sucked under by being too near, would be in danger of being swamped by the wave her sinking would create and we all knew our boat was in no condition to ride big waves, crowded as it was, and manned with untrained oarsmen. The second was that an explosion might result from the water getting to the boilers, and debris might fall within a wide radius, and yet, as it turned out, neither of these things happened. At about 2.15 a.m., I think we were any distance from a mile to two miles away, it is difficult for a landsman to calculate distance at sea, but we had been afloat an hour and a half. The boat was heavily loaded, the oarsmen unskilled, and our course erratic, following now one light and now another, sometimes a star and sometimes a light from a port light boat, which had turned away from the Titanic in the opposite direction, and lay almost on our horizon, so we could not have gone very far away. About this time, the water had crept up almost to her side light and the captain's bridge, and it seemed a question only of minutes before she sank. The oarsmen lay on their oars, and all in the lifeboat were motionless as we watched her in absolute silence, 
save some who would not look and buried their heads on each other's shoulders. The lights still shone with the same brilliance, but not so many of them. Many were now below the surface. I have often wondered since whether they continued to light up the cabins when the portholes were under water, they may have done so. And then, as we gazed awestruck, she tilted slowly up, revolving apparently about a center of gravity just astern of amidships, until she attained a vertically upright position, and there she remained, motionless. As she swung up, her lights, which had shone without a flicker all night, went out suddenly, came on again for a single flash, then went out altogether. And as they did so, there came a noise which many people, wrongly, I think, have described as an explosion. It has always seemed to me that it was nothing but the engines and machinery coming loose from their bolts and bearings, and falling through the compartments, smashing everything in their way. It was partly a roar, partly a groan, partly a rattle, and partly a smash, and it was not a sudden roar as an explosion would be. It went on successively for some seconds, possibly fifteen to twenty, as the heavy machinery dropped down to the bottom, now the bows, of the ship. I suppose it fell through the end and sank first, before the ship. But it was a noise no one had heard before, and no one wishes to hear again. It was stupefying, stupendous, as it came to us along the water. It was as if all the heavy things one could think of had been thrown downstairs from the top of a house, smashing each other and the stairs and everything in the way. Several apparently authentic accounts have been given in which definite stories of explosions have been related, in some cases even with the wreckage blown up and the ship broken in two. But I think such accounts will not stand close analysis. In the first place, the fires had been withdrawn, and the steam allowed to escape some time before she sank, and the possibility of explosion from this cause seems very remote. Then, as just related, the noise was not sudden and definite, but prolonged, more like the roll and crash of thunder. The probability of the noise being caused by engines falling down will be seen by referring to Figure 2, page 116, where the engines are placed in compartments 3, 4, and 5. As the Titanic tilted up, they would almost certainly fall loose from their bed and plunge down through the other compartments. No phenomenon like that pictured in some American and English papers occurred, that of the ship breaking in two, and the two ends being raised above the surface. I saw these drawings in preparation on board the Carpathia, and said at the time that they bore no resemblance to what actually happened. When the noise was over, the Titanic was still upright like a column. We could see her now only as the stern and some 150 feet of her stood outlined against the star-specked sky, looming black in the darkness, and in this position she continued for some minutes. I think as much as five minutes, but it may have been less. Then, first sinking back a little at the stern, I thought, she slid slowly forwards, through the water, and dived slantingly down. The sea closed over her, and we had seen the last of the beautiful ship on which we had embarked four days before at Southampton. And in place of the ship on which all our interest had been concentrated for so long, and towards which we looked most of the time, because it was still the only object on the sea which was a fixed point to us, in place of the Titanic, we had the level sea now stretching in an unbroken expanse to the horizon, heaving gently, just as before, with no indication on the surface that the waves had just closed over the most wonderful vessel ever built by man's hand. The stars looked down just the same, and the air was just as bitterly cold. There seemed a great sense of loneliness when we were left on the sea in a small boat without the Titanic. Not that we were uncomfortable, except for the cold, nor in danger. We did not think we were either. 
but the Titanic was no longer there. We waited head on for the wave which we thought might come, the wave we had heard so much of from the crew, and which they said had been known to travel for miles, and it never came. But although the Titanic left us no such legacy of a wave as she went to the bottom, she left us something we would willingly forget forever, something which is well not to let the imagination dwell on, the cries of many hundreds of our fellow passengers struggling in the ice-cold water. I would willingly omit any further mention of this part of the disaster from this book, but for two reasons it is not possible. First, that as a matter of history it should be put on record, and secondly, that these cries were not only an appeal for help in the awful conditions of danger in which the drowning found themselves, an appeal that could never be answered, but an appeal to the whole world to make such conditions of danger and hopelessness impossible ever again, a cry that called to the heavens for the very injustice of its own existence a cry that clamored for its own destruction. We were utterly surprised to hear this cry go up as the waves closed over the Titanic. We had heard no sound of any kind from her since we left her side, and as mentioned before, we did not know how many boats she had or how many rafts. The crew may have known, but they probably did not, and if they did, they never told the passengers. We should not have been surprised to know all were safe on some life-saving device. So that, unprepared as we were for such a thing, the cries of the drowning floating across the quiet sea filled us with stupefaction. We longed to return and rescue at least some of the drowning, but we knew it was impossible. The boat was filled to standing room, and to return would mean the swamping of us all, and so the Captain Stoker told his crew to row away from the cries. We tried to sing to keep all from thinking of them, but there was no heart for singing in the boat at that time. The cries, which were loud and numerous at first, died away gradually, one by one, but the night was clear frosty, and still, the water smooth, and the sounds must have carried on its level surface free from any obstruction for miles, certainly much farther from the ship than we were situated. I think the last of them must have been heard nearly forty minutes after the Titanic sank. Life belts would keep the survivors afloat for hours, but the cold water was what stopped the cries. There must have come to all those safe in the lifeboats, scattered round the drowning at various distances, a deep resolve that, if anything could be done by them in the future to prevent the repetition of such sounds, they would do it, at whatever cost of time or other things. And not only to them are those cries an imperative call, but to every man and woman who has known of them. It is not possible that ever again can such conditions exist? But it is a duty imperative on one and all to see that they do not. Think of it. A few more boats, a few more planks of wood nailed together in a particular way at a trifling cost, and all those men and women whom the world can so ill afford to lose would be with us today. There would be no mourning in thousands of homes which now are desolate and these words need not have been written. End of The Sinking of the Titanic, Seen from a Lifeboat by Lawrence Beasley